Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, joining Restored Hope um, on the second segment. Um, looks like you're coming all into the main room. My team will pull you in here. There are a couple things we can't do for you during the online event, and we can't move you from one location like the main session into a workshop. So that became a little bit of an issue for a couple of people. Um, apparently, iPhones handle things differently than Androids and laptops and tablets. So iPhone products, it turns out if you have Crowdcast on your phone that you're watching with, then you have to turn it sideways to be able to see the menu. And then this white bar pops up and you click it and then you can pick the thing. So if you're holding it this way, it doesn't show it, but if you turn it sideways, who would have known? I don't have an iPhone. <laughs> I have something else. They always have to be a little bit different, right? So, geez, challenges, challenges. So um, our next segment, I just want to introduce uh, what's going to happen in this next part uh, of our day. There are a bunch of fun things that are going to happen. One is uh, we're going to have more life stories. Uh, everybody's story is slightly different. And I want to point out that although some people continue to have residual same-sex attraction, and temptation is to be expected in this planet on this earth, um, residual meaning it doesn't have power over you anymore um, as opposed to uh, constant and really intense test, uh, temptation although that might flare up from time to time Andrew gave an expression like that where he encountered that at one point uh, and worked through it so just an FYI um, we're not talking about it all or nothing here in fact Instead of a light switch, which I have a light switch back here, on or off, right? Um, rather, life in Christ is more like a dial. It's more like, um, how are you doing? And actually, Dan Hitz is going to cover temptation um, as a gauge, as a way to tell where you are in your walk in Jesus and what stresses you're going through. Um, he will be covering that tomorrow in workshops. So I hope that you tune in. Um, so anyway, a dial is one thing. Another thing is if you think about a line graph. I love graphs. I'm kind of a nerd. I've got that underlying characteristic that now you know, right? <laughs> so um, line graphs show a direction in life, growing in holiness, growing in the walk with Jesus. But even then, when you're walking securely with Christ, you might go through something that triggers pain or sorrow or grief or that junior high feeling that Andrew expressed earlier. And during that time, yes, the workshop's called Praying Beyond Our Temptations. During that time, you fight, might find yourself more vulnerable. So instead of the light switch idea, we aren't light switches, we're humans. And we, we experience life around us. We're going to experience all sorts of different directions with how to do that. If we're walking closely with Jesus, we should be becoming more and more like him. Um, and that is the goal of the Christian life. Um, so <clears throat> some people, about 30%, 32% of people, no longer experience same-sex attraction, though it might flare up from time to time because they do have that past. But in general, they don't experience same-sex attraction. Another 28% uh, of people experience ongoing, or slightly more than that, I think it was 38%, continue to experience some degree of same-sex attraction, but they're still walking with Christ. They're not walking out of their sin struggle. So just want to let you know that that's more of a realistic uh, perspective. There are a variety of experiences and to or downplay anybody's experience would be disrespectful. So what I, what I want to do is ask you as the body of Christ, to keep in mind that people's experiences in overcoming homosexuality goes from, gosh, this is really not part of my life anymore, period. I may have other struggles. To, I may have an ongoing same-sex attraction from time to time. Like Brenna Kate said, it pops up, but on rare occasion, and it's not in charge of me, right? So there's all of that. But at the beginning, in my walk, I really struggled on a moment-by-moment, day-by-day, uh, expression of same-sex attraction and all of my female friendships were sexualized 
until God did a lot of work in my heart. So I had to find a safe place to walk through this. And the safe place I, I got to walk through it was a local ministry that was run by Frank and Anita Worthen. I got to be real. I got to be honest, just the way everybody else is talking about, where you actually get to open up some of the pain and sorrow and um, struggle, be honest with your struggle, and find that I wasn't rejected, that I could be loved in the middle of it, and then things began to uh, go away as far as temptation. So just an FYI, those are some of the things to keep in mind. Now, N Dr. Nancy Hayes is going to be sharing with us her keynote, and she will be able to see and hear me <laughs> when I introduce her uh, and come back on to do the Q&A. So don't worry, Nancy, I will be there with you. Um, uh, also, the Achievement Lifetime Achievement Award is being given out this segment. Um, I'm excited to share with you about that person and have his wife join us on screen shortly. There will also be some surprise guests this afternoon, and that's going to be a really exciting time to visit with some, some really profound people who uh, love the ministry of Restored Hope and love uh, helping people walk out of sin struggle. And looking forward to having them join us and um, excited to share with you who they are as we get closer. So right now, um, I also want to remind you that um, you have access to the conference materials page on the RestoredHopeNetwork.org website page. Uh, the conference, if you click events, you'll go directly to that page and then just choose conference materials and all the pre-recorded workshops are there including Brenna Cates. Really profound stuff so I hope you can join check that out when you're done with this. Um, also really really great is that we've been able to bless over 14 people. I think it's uh, I forget the number of scholarships uh, more recently have even come in and that's because of all the people who donated to the scholarship fund. So I just want to thank you attendees for providing for other people to be able to attend. And again, we have people from six different nations joining us from around the world. Okay, well, I'm going to introduce uh, next Gabriel Pagan. Gabriel was set free from same-sex attractions, a life of shame and brokenness. He serves as the deliverance and inner healing pastor of Love Revolution Church. He travels to equip the church to minister to the LGBTQ community while sharing his story. He longs to see the church equipped with tools to disempower the mindsets the enemy carries so that the followers of Jesus Christ can walk in freedom, fulfilling the call of God in their lives. In September of 2019, Gabriel got married to his lovely and beautiful wife. And the pictures I remember as this was happening on Facebook, it was like awesome. It was just so fun to watch. Um, then they got pregnant and he has a little son who's two, right? Is he two? He, I can't hear you. Oh, right? sorry. He's about to be one. Oh, he's about to be one. Mm -hmm. He's so darn cute. Thank and you. not only that, but he and his wife just recently got pregnant again. His wife did. His wife yeah. And now she's pregnant with twins. <laughs> That's awesome. Team no sleep. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Exhausting and awesome all at the same time. Gabriel, welcome. I'm so delighted that you're here with us, and I can't wait for our folks to hear your story. I'm so happy. This I is am awesome. thrilled. So bless you. Take it away. So I, I grew up going to church. I um, can't say that there was a specific time in my life where I felt connected to God or experience anything that didn't come across as principles and being young i definitely just wanted to stay at home and go to sleep you know as for anybody um my dad got saved before i was born so going to church for me wasn't an option and um around the time that i was eight or nine is when i was first exposed to sexual activity and somebody had experimented on me um, based off the pornography that they saw. And that went on for a good bit of time. And I didn't have a grid 
to, you know, analyze or look through and be like, hey, this isn't right or hey, this isn't normal. I remember thinking to myself, like, why am I being touched? But um, at the same time, it felt good. So I didn't really say anything. Um, That carried on until I learned in school (laughs) what certain names meant when people called me queer and gay and gay Gabe and gay real. And I mean, kids can be, man, (laughs) intense sometimes. But I, um, I didn't know what it meant until I found out. And crazy, I was doing this stuff. And then I found out after I was already, you know, sexually active, like, oh, this means that you're gay. And I didn't really act out towards my peers. Um, I definitely felt rejected by boys because they're way, 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 way more aggressive than I was at the time. So I was very sensitive. I hung out with girls. Um, I wanted just to make everybody laugh and that carried on. So I got into middle school and high school and that was when I would probably say on my own end, um, that I made the volitional choice to act out on my feelings. I had intrusive thoughts about being gay. I would have just flashes in my mind of me doing stuff with the boys next to me. And I remember thinking, Oh, this is how you make friendship. This is how you do stuff. Like, I would like super eroticize the hero out of any movie. Um, And I wasn't really even paying attention to my own thoughts, which thank God the Holy spirit is a counselor because (laughs) he made sense out of all my mess. And I remember even thinking thoughts like I would do this. If this person would be my dad, like I would do this. If this person would be my friend, I would do this. This person would be my brother. So like even at a young age, I learned this is how you keep somebody close. And by the time I got in high school and became sexually active, um, everybody in my school found out. And I'm going to be open for the sake that this would bring healing and a measure of discipleship for people who utilize, you know, inner healing or, you know, listening prayer or what, what, what have you to help people in their process. But I remember the first time I had hooked up, um, it was not for a long period of time. And when I got to school, everybody made fun of me for the duration that I had acted out with this guy. And I remember feeling so ashamed of people like calling me quick and making fun of me that I like full on fought for control out of all my hookups. It was one of the most traumatic moments of my life. Being called gay, people call me quick, body part, name, in school. And I remember being like, I can't handle this. So I went home. I started binging on pornography. And every hookup I had after that, I had to have control. In the gay community, I wouldn't let people um, do things with me. I had to be the one that was in control. I didn't feel safe with other guys. And I never had, I would say, a long lasting intimacy and relationship. It was very much like using people. And I got to a point where I was tired of living like double life. And I came out to some of my friends and, um, I didn't really know how to be gay. I mean, you, you'd think that there's more to this identity coming out. Um, and for me, I didn't know what that was besides hooking up. Um, you know, I hung out with a friend of mine and I was very sheltered growing up. So I wasn't even like super even allowed to leave my yard, which like... <laughs> was a unique experience in in and of itself. But I remember going and I got exposed to pornography and this is when we exchanged dial up for broadband. So I'm I'm very prehistoric. I had dial up internet. Um, But I remember um, being exposed to pornography, finding how to have it for myself. And 
that was kind of how I learned how to hook up with the community because of community uploads are now a thing on um, community uploads is pretty much on every porn site. You know, people do their own cell phone videos or what have you. And I found myself going into public places, trying to find an older man, trying to find a brother, trying to find um, connection with the very areas of my life that, you know, there's a veil over us until we come to Jesus. I didn't know that these relationships were the ones that were struggling the most in my life. As far as friends, brother, father role, like all that. So, um, and putting myself into public places like public bathrooms and doing this stuff. Um, I was around 15, 14 and 15 when I started doing this, I almost get kidnapped, which then like fed this fantasy that gets fed, um, through pornography. Cause pornography doesn't really tell you like, you know, this level of eroticizing things is actually mentally unhealthy for you. You know, this, this is what addiction looks like when you're going to a public place. This is actually like you're crossing a threshold. You don't hear that. It's very celebrated. Um, and so in my mind, everything I thought I was doing was normal. So I almost got kidnapped by this guy. I heard the Holy spirit knowing now that this is the Holy spirit, but I was trying to fish and, and this guy followed me. And the Lord told me after finding this out, I was being a believer that if I would, if I didn't leave, he was going to kidnap me. So there were moments where God had his hand on me for sure. I mean, he's always had his hand on me, but there was moments where he would try to pull me out. And I didn't know that I could invite him into where I was. Even if I was in the bathroom in the moment, I didn't know that I could call on the Lord to counsel me and be with me and walk me out of my frustration and pain and even meet me in meet me in brokenness, you know? Um, I might get a little emotional, so I'm sorry. I think, you know, after that feat, that fed a fantasy of wanting to be raped and, you know, I went into this really, really deep, painful place where I was suicidal because I felt like there was no way out. I was tired of being gay. I was tired of feeling used like a girl. And, um, I decided that I was just going to be celibate. I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep doing the same old thing. I'm just going to live celibate. And I didn't know at the time that people were praying for me. I, my band broke up and after that had happened, um, I was just suicidal. I felt like I had nothing going for me. Everyone made fun of me for being gay, you know, like 10, 11, 12 years ago, it was not as acceptable to be gay as much as it is now. And I just remember, yeah, I just remember feeling so, so broken. I felt like I had nothing going for me. I, I really couldn't like rationalize like the things that I had done. Um, and it was very tormenting. Ooh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> and I just remember feeling like if things didn't change, I was going to kill myself. And in 2012, when all this was, you know, <laughs> bubbling up to the surface, this guy reached out to me on my Facebook. And I just felt, sure, go hang out with him. Now, at this time, I sexualized everything. So I was wanting... Everything had to be sex. It was the only way I could escape. You know, there were other drugs involved, but, you know, I think that's where I found the most connection and intimacy because I wasn't being fully real. And I had bought into the lie that, like, physical connection is, like, the ultimate. And um, fast forward, this guy ends up hanging out with me. He reaches out to me on Facebook and was like, you know, hey, um, I felt one day, before I get ahead of myself, I felt one day um, led to just change my life. And I was a musician. Um, like I said, my band broke up, but I felt I had a following. I had influence where I was. And so um, I posted that naturally. You know, millennials, we put our whole life out on the internet. So 
I just said what I felt. This guy reached out to me. And the very same day, he led me to the Lord. Um, the best way I can describe what happened to you was I had a very unemotional prayer. Um, and I just said, God, if you still want me, please come save me. Like, not even like how I'm feeling emotional right now, because I'm just like, I don't know. I just feel really sensitive to his heart because I feel like the weight of people like carrying this. But I was just like, God, if you still want me, please save me. Because living in the Bible Belt, you hear you need to get right with God at least a thousand times. Okay, and then you cuss somebody out on the way to Golden Corral, right? <laughs> like three point sermons. Get out of my way. I'm gonna go eat Cracker Barrel. I mean, hello, this is the South. So, um, when I felt the presence of God, it fell on me like fire. And I remember thinking, like, what was that? A week later, I meet my pastor at a Bible study, and he was like, hey, I want to hang out with you. I want to um, get to know you. Let's go get coffee. And I was like, sure. I was so hungry for male attention. Oh, my gosh. If you were like a strong, straight male, like you're already an idol in my life, right? So we hung out, and he was like, hey, the Lord gave me some words for you. Do you care if I share them? Now, I'm going to let you know right now, I was literally not in the Bible at all. So you could have told me that the Bible taught me how to levitate, and I would 100% believe you. And I was like, sure, tell me what the Lord said. You know, you got some word school. And he said, the Holy Spirit showed me that you were, excuse me, molested, and that you struggle with homosexuality. And Jesus wants you to know he loves you, and he's going to walk with you through this. And that was like the first time I ever felt like I was like super outed besides like being in high school. And it was like this connection because I couldn't live like this, like, oh, I'm not gay. That was just some stuff that happened. I was on drugs. Like I couldn't like deny the eyes of God. You know what I mean? Like I was fully seen in this moment. But at the same time, it felt safe to just admit where I was. And my pastor was just like, Okay, like for me, it was the biggest deal. I was like, I'm gay. And um, he was like, okay. Like <laughs> I swore being gay was like the biggest thing. Like it, for me, it was like the biggest battlefield. But for him, he was just like, okay. Like that doesn't change how I see you. And from then on, he let me live on his couch. He bought me food three times a day. I did not have a job. I dropped out of high school. I just got my GED and basically taught me about the kingdom. And I definitely don't want to spend too much time glorifying sexual brokenness. And I want to share what it was like inviting Jesus into my sexuality because that I feel like people being like fully real and transparent about what does it look like when Jesus disciples that. And not just like surface level stuff. Like he walked me out of sexual immorality. Like, okay, but details. Like what what happened? So um, I got filled with the Holy Spirit in October of 2012, which was three weeks after I got saved. And I want to say as soon as I started following the Lord, everything in me that I tried to suppress just started coming out like, you pop a, like a, a water balloon and like water is slowly dripping out. <laughs> and I just remember feeling so like fearful that I started running from God, not knowing that he was using everything that the enemy tried to trigger to heal. So like the very thing that the enemy wants to accuse you of is literally what God wants to heal. Like the enemy 100% overplays his hand every time whatever you're ashamed of literally is a door of intimacy like it could be torment or it could be intimacy and the voice that we present what goes on in our, in our mind to so say like there's stuff going on in our mind what we yield to determines on what's going to build we can feed torment we can buy the lie or we receive that, okay, I'm freaking out. God, please help me again. That then makes it a door of intimacy where he wants to meet you and be revealed as a good shepherd. And the Lord just 
man, I had so many encounters with Jesus. I had a vision of him healing the memory of when I was molested. And I remember like seeing his eyes and the way he looked at me, like I was the only person that ever existed. And I know that sounds like it's not hard to believe about Jesus, but he truly looks at you in a way that makes you feel like you have all his attention. There's no shame in anything that you bring up. There's compassion. There's full acceptance where you're not even considering your own sin. Like it just has to fall off. And um, in the same way taught me how to like not listen to my body. So that sounds kind of like a weird phrase. I would say out of abuse and addiction, there's sometimes unwanted stimulation. And the Lord would, like, I, I went on this outreach and I got so far into like weird fetishized subcultures, not anything illegal, praise God. But um, I remember I went on outreach and when I tried to do the things of God, it would be that's when the accusation came the most. And I remember I was ministering to the gospel, nothing sexual. I prayed for this guy. I got super stimulated, like on the spot. And I was like, whoo, <laughs> danger zone. And literally a voice came in my mind and said, see, God didn't save you. You're still an effing faggot. And I was like, whoa, this is really heavy. I'm, I can't deal. Like, this is too much. And my pastor just told me, you know, whenever you, whenever you're in that place, just to ask the Holy Spirit, when a thought comes in your mind, what does the Holy Spirit think about that? You know, test your thoughts. And so I said, Holy Spirit, what, what's, what's the deal with this thought? Does that mean that I'm gay? And he literally told me, he said, don't listen to that voice. It's a demon. And he said, the only touch you've ever known always led to sex. So the same way Abraham believed against hope and didn't consider his body, I just believe what God said. Not, that doesn't mean that it doesn't come with like pressure or pain, but his voice carries the true definition of like our life and where we are presently more than our feelings do. Like our minds come attached. This is going to sound like really weird. I'm not trying to sound that way. Our minds, when it comes to like our bodies and feelings and things are so attached to our history that we don't see the new creation that he's viewing us from. And so I was, you know, if we give him the permission, even those shameful moments are foundational stepping stones of freedom where I didn't think any time after that where most people can be like, no, baby, that's still like attraction. And there's still like confusion in that regard and eroticizing of the same sex because I felt like I wasn't like them, but I would say I didn't carry the mindset of, Oh, I'm sexually attracted to you. I'm like, Oh, this is just muscle memory. Like I, there's a difference. True. Thank you so much for your vulnerability, Gabriel. Your your testimony is profound. It's no small thing. God has done amazing things and is continuing to do amazing things in you. And he's made you a victor, not a yes. victim, hasn't he? He's making you that. And each one of those battles you fight and you walk out the other end, just like the rest of us, um, you become the victor. And the enemy, I love what you shared about um, Satan, the accuser. That's his name. Yeah. Uh, he is the accuser. He uses accusation, con condemnation towards you. And that's an opportunity to take that condemnation and go, okay, God, what do you think about this? And see that redemptive intimacy with our Heavenly Father. You've been born again. You belong to Him. But there is a lot of stuff. Of course, the history has to be worked out somehow. And you deserve male attention and belonging that is non-sexual. Yeah. You deserve brotherhood. You deserve to be a son. You deserve to be, uh, get all the affection. Every single one of us. God intends for us to belong. He put us in a huge family. And uh, I am so happy that you're in mine. So Thank I you. I love you. Here. Man, I love you too. I really do. I have sons that are a bit younger than you, but I feel like, yeah, you're be a very old son. Ooh. <laughs> How old am I? Oh yeah, I have gray hair. I can handle that. 
<laughs> I'd say you're but, 29, 30, in between 29 okay, and 32. Okay, my oldest is 24, so I think you could be an older <laughs> Man, I, all I can say is I sure love you, and I'm so grateful that you joined you. Uh, the Hope Conference to share, and I look forward to hearing more from you. I don't know if you're aware, but somebody asked for a sermon, essentially, and you'll have to come back and share with us another time, maybe what you teach churches, but right now we've run out of time. Yeah, 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 say. absolutely. Okay, well, love you, man. I'll talk to you later. See ya. Okay. Wasn't that amazing? Thank you so much. His vulnerability and just rawness, millennials, just get out there and tell it like it is. There's something refreshing about that, isn't there? So let me bring on the next uh, individual who will be sharing. We have another testimony coming up, and that's Abby and Jan Clark. They're in uh, Ari Arkansas, not Arizona. They're in Arkansas. Abby left the homosexual life in 2015 to pursue a relationship with Jesus. She is going to share that journey with you, a journey of hope and restoration. Jan is Abby's mom. Jan will share a little bit about her journey from her perspective. So looking forward to hearing their story together. Thank you so much for joining us and good to see you in person. We've been on phones up until now. So <laughs> awesome. All right. Take it away, you two. All right. Well, I'm going to start. Um, there came an evening in late March of 1999, and our only daughter, our only child, stopped me in the hallway and announced to me that she believed that she was born gay. She believed this for quite a while. Well, I'm telling you, this was during the fourth year of the worst years that we had had in our marriage, mine and Bob's. And I was like, what else? Um, four years before that, he had lost his job. And he could not find one to replace it. And we, we were in bad financial crisis, but then we never did handle money very well anyway. Um, the problems between Bob and I just did not go well. We, our marriage was in trouble. We'd married when we were 17 and 20, and the, the problems that we had taken to the altar was still bugging with us. Bob had been sexually abused as a young boy. Um, and he dealt with pornography that he was introduced to with, uh, in his teen years. So this just um, followed our, our lives. I did not realize how much that had to do with his personality and how he dealt with things. So I was angry. I was very, very angry. We didn't talk about it, nothing. Um, I'd been raised in a Bible-believing family, church, and I mean, I knew all the stuff. I'd been saved at eight years old, but I came into my teen years just firmly believing that I was the only human in history that God had just completely made a mess of. He had flubbed up, and I was it. So, um, you know, um, Abby had begun in all this environment, and we went to church. We raised her in church. Uh, we taught her the word, but I know we did not model the kind of marriage she needed to see in front of us. So um, she had begun to have lots of difficulties and she was very dishonoring to us. We had helped her find her birth mother and that was that was just a complete stress. And it, um, I love her, I love her dearly, but she was very distracting in our lives. Um, um, Abby, three weeks before that announcement, she had had a mental breakdown, and it was very profound, and it, we were reeling from that. Um, so there was just craziness and chaos. Um, that night after she, I heard what she said, um, I, I was very silent for a minute, and my belief has always been if I talk loud enough, long enough, and hard enough, I'm going to fix that problem. And I could not. I, it was just more than I could handle. And so um, I looked at her and there was silence for a minute. And I heard God say, um, talking won't help. And I was just like, whoa. And out of my mouth came and where it came from, I have no idea. I heard, Abby, I'm not worried about that. God will take care of it. And she just looked at me, and there was silence. And then I heard out of my mouth, it'll be okay. 
I don't know where it's going to go, but it'll be okay. She walked away, and I just stood there and said, God help us. So, um, yes, I was adopted at birth, and I see God's hand all over that. I'm so grateful um, that he chose these parents for me. Um, they're a blessing, yeah, and yeah. He, there's a lot of protection in that, in that decision um, for me to be adopted out. But it did play a role in some identity confusion that I struggled with, not knowing, you know, not looking like anyone and not having any blood relatives around. But um, <laughs> we grew up in the church, or I grew up in the church. They raised me in church. We were there all the time. Um, I was in Bible studies and Sunday school classes and um, eventually youth groups. But none of us knew what it meant to be sold out to Christ. None of us knew what it meant to be yeah. a disciple. Oh, wow. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, struggles in the home. My parents fought a lot, a lot of yelling, um, a lot of yelling. And it brought me a lot of anxiety and fear, um, watching that happen in the marriage. And so we also had a lot of financial issues and we had to move a couple of times, um, at times that were really difficult for me in school. Um, my dad struggled with pornography for a good portion of my life and my mom, um, didn't want to see it. Um, and so I kind of dealt with that on my own through my teens. It was very difficult. Um, I did have some early sexual encounters. I was sexualized very young by peers in my neighborhood. It was mostly girls who I now know were abused. And, um, you know, that uh, led into some same-sex attraction that began very young, you know, six years old and continued until... Um, until recently. And um, I was also really athletic and I struggled with that because I, I never felt feminine. I never felt like a woman and guys didn't want to date me. They wanted to, um, you know, I played soccer with them and I could beat some of them. And so they didn't want to date someone like me. Um, they were just my good buddies. And so that also played into that, you know, identity confusion stuff. And uh, I began to believe that maybe I was made this way. I was made this way to be attracted to women. Um, I met my birth mother and birth father, like my mom said, and it was very difficult. I didn't pursue God's um, will in that. <laughs> I acted completely out of my my flesh, and um, you know it was a poor decision. And I know I hurt them, and I hurt our relationship. Um, but God has worked through that um, in the years past um, after that. Um, my teens were pretty bad, um, drugs, alcohol. Um, I attempted suicide. I ended up in mental hospitals. I spent um, my graduation from high school in a mental hospital. Uh, praise God, I was able to graduate. Um, and then I, um, you know, all during this time, I'm having relationships with women. They're very unhealthy. I'm still using drugs, but my early 20s, I started to pursue God. Like, I, I, I realized this was not what he had for me. Um, and so I started to pursue him, and I started to get some emotional healing, not necessarily from same-sex attraction, but um, in other ways. Well, after this, this big, huge announcement, the truth be told, things got worse before they got better. We were continuing to deal with this um, mental breakdown, for about two and a half years, it was pretty bad. Um, her birth mother was still there. And um, we were just having a really tough time. And again, financial problems. And um, But there was a little bit of a surrender for me. The night that God told me that talking won't help. And in that regard, I tried very, very hard as I dealt with Abby to not talk to her about the issue unless she came to me. And that became my rule. I did not follow it completely, but that became my rule. So God did work. Uh, we met a lady by the name of Kim. I had never met her before. Met her in kind of an odd way. She came into our life. She had raised three teenage kids that were addicted to drugs, and she had been through hell with them. And she saw what chaos we had, and she asked if uh, we wanted her to um, help us reparent our child. We had a lot of learning to do. We set up a list of boundaries, uh, rules that Abby had to follow. And um, one of those was in regard to relationships with um, any same-sex attracted person that she would have in girl that came in. And 
And that boundary was anyone, anyone Abby brings in is welcome. And, um, but if it's a same sex attraction relationship, they cannot sleep together. They have to sleep in separate beds. Um, and it was really scary. I was, I was really afraid we were going to lose our daughter. She could have just walked away. I mean, she had found her birth parents and there was lots and lots of fear in this. Um, but she began to get better. Um, within about a couple of years, she was working and she started going to school, going to school part time. And we told her as long as she was in school that she could live at home. Uh, birth mother situation was still there, but it calmed down. And um, uh, but we were still a mess. Um, Abby kind of went in and out of homosexuality. Um, and um, at one point, she apparently met her future partner online and uh, she moved away 500 miles um, to live with that partner. And that was really, really, talk about empty nests. That was really hard, very, very hard. But at the same time, God put us in a church that taught freedom and taught who we were in Christ and our, mm -hmm. um, our um, identity in Christ and what our purpose was. And so we were beginning to learn some things, but we just didn't want to give up and forgive each other and do something about our marriage. Um, Abby brought her partner home for a weekend, and I was very scared. And um, I was afraid, but I was cleaning house that day. I was I was cooking and, and baking and getting ready to have a good weekend. And um, when um, her partner walked in the door, I saw how scared she was. And I just fell in love with her. I um, I just hurt for her. You know, if I was as scared, she was more scared than I was. Um, so um, we got to know her and we began to visit back and forth. We would drive up to where they lived. They would come down to see us. Uh, we got to know, um, you know, her family. And it was just, um, it was different. But it was where God had us at, at that time. Um, so, um, in about 15, 13, she let us know that uh, she wanted to come out of homosexuality. She was convicted that it was a wrong and a sinful relationship. And we thought that it was going to just be over in a few, you know, weeks. And um, uh, we were praising the Lord and it took another two years. And we didn't realize until later how much her partner was hurt and how hurt I felt for her partner through this. But Abby was gone. She was going to stay where she was at, and it was time for us to work on our marriage. And there were things that got worse. I ended up having a breakdown. I checked myself into a mental, um, a psych ward. And um, my husband began to see how, how devastated I was. And um, he was so emotionally detached, but he began to attach, and he talked to me and go into a, a marriage uh, program in our church called Reengage. And um, I told him, no way am I going to do that. I mean, people know us as Jan and Bob. We're this little short, dumpy, little happy family. And I'm a happy couple. And we're going to go in there and tell them that we've had problems all of our married life, which was like close to 50. And But God is gracious and God is good. And um, I'm here telling you that our marriage has been healed. And um, uh, the things with Abby is is awesome. Um I don't want to tie this up in a real big happy bow and make it sound like everything is great. It is not great. We have a lot. We still have a lot of growth to do. We have a, my whole thing is to glorify God through this entire thing. Give him the glory. I had nothing to do with it. God blessed even when I was rebellious. Mm -hmm. I praise God. Amen. And so this is the part I've been most excited to tell you about because of what God has done, not just in their marriage, but in our family and in my life, in my relationship with him and with others. Um, you know, I did move in with that partner. We spent the next seven years building a life together, a home, animals, our family's vacation together. But the conviction that I experienced every time I was around someone who was a Christian or um, if my partner would want to go to church and I would give in and we'd go and the conviction was just so heavy. Um, I knew deep down I wouldn't be able to, 
you know, pushed that away just by drinking um, for very long. And so in 2015, I had begun working at a really good job in a women's prison, and um, I was actually doing drug and alcohol counseling. And I, um, we have a chaplain in the prison, and I, I just, you know, felt like a kinship with him. And I began to share with him the conviction I was experiencing, and he didn't pressure me, he didn't push me, he just, he just listened and he prayed. And um, and then I had a coworker as well who I knew was a Christian, and so I'd kind of kept my distance because I was convicted every time <laughs> she got within five feet of me. Um, and one day I stopped her as she walked past my office, and I said, I need help. I, I can't ignore God anymore. And she um, got to tell me that she came out of the lifestyle many years ago, and um, she turned into one of my mentors and she's my sister now. Um, but God has just used her mightily to just pour into me. And she's um, who took me to About Hope is the is the group that I attend here in Arkansas. And that's how I found out about Restored Hope Network. And um, that group is really unique. It's um, parents and loved ones of people that are in the lifestyle. Um, but it also incorporates people like me who've come out of the lifestyle or some who still struggle. And so everybody gets to see a different perspective. I got to see the heart of my parents and what they were experiencing. And those parents get to see the struggle that we as now overcomers uh, were going through, that we weren't trying to hurt them. Um, We were hurting so bad, we couldn't even see how we were hurting others, you know? Um, I began to dive into the word. Um, I walked out of my relationship in 2015, scared to death that my partner would hate God. And the opposite happened. And she began to pursue Christ with all of her heart. And um, that's just been one of the most miraculous parts of this whole thing. Um, So I've just, I dove into the word. Um, I uh, decided to, or God led me to um, start my master's in divinity program. Um, I realized I wanted to be a chaplain. I, I want to be a hospital chaplain. And so um, I graduated with my MDiv in, in last September, and I've been working in a chaplaincy program. I will be done hopefully in December, and I can work toward getting board certified as a chaplain because I know that God is the only answer, and I can't waste any more time not <laughs> spreading that message. Um, I... I, I just um, am overwhelmed by the healing that he has brought into this family. I'm overwhelmed by the confidence that we all three now have with our identities completely founded in Christ and what he did for us. Um, I really spend a lot of time um, in Romans chapter 8, um, just reminding myself because, you know, the enemy wants to throw in condemnation. And so, um, you know, I I don't walk by the flesh anymore. I died with Christ and I raised to life. I don't have to walk in the flesh anymore. When I finally grasped that, it was like, I love you, Jesus. I love you more than I love my emotions. I love you more than I love my parents. I will follow you. I figured out what it meant. The spirit gave me that. Um, that knowing of what it means to pick up my cross, that what he has for us one day doesn't compare even anywhere close to some trials, some struggles, some suffering we may have to endure. We have forever. We have forever in glory with him, and I will lay it all down for that. It is not easy every day. I don't just float through the day like no struggle, Um, but what I do know And I learned a lot of this as an addictions counselor, is that if I struggle alone, the enemy gets a playground. Yes, I did. He just grabs hold and he can convince me of so many things. Yes. So I'm never alone when I struggle. I reach out. I reach out to people in um, the About Hope group. I reach out to friends. I reach out to my um, coworker, the chaplain, my parents. I don't do it alone because they can speak truth over me when I'm so dark in a hole that I can't even open my Bible. Um, And I just know where to turn back to. I go back to Christ. He is um, all I need. When I walked out of that lifestyle, I had a bunch of empty space left. 
it, it, it was it was painful. He filled every bit of that in with himself. And now I'm I'm like, why? Why did I think that was better than Jesus? I I you know, because I was blind. And um last thing, I love the book of Hebrews. Um, I love being reminded that I have a high priest who did it once and for all, who did it in my place. He makes appeals for me to God. He prays for me. He prays for my strength and my courage when the enemy is attacking. And uh, I'm just, I'm just grateful. And I pray that you guys hear hope. Um, he's not done working. He's never done working. And when they thought he was done working, um, they just didn't know what was going on Amen. behind the scenes. Amen. He was always working. Amen. And his promises come true. His word does not return void. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, my can I goodness. Give, can I give two scriptures? Sure, please do. God gave me um, Psalms 27, 13. I, remind, I, I remain confident of this. I will see goodness in the land of the living. And I held on to that. And um, my God is gracious. And um, he gives a hope that nothing else can. Amen. He does. And it's so evident in you both. I am grateful. Okay. Look at that. I love this. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank Profound, you for allowing us. Beautiful. And uh, look forward to connecting another time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <sighs> Wasn't that something, you guys? Just a, a quick quote here. I love you more than my feelings. I love you more than my parents. And then, of course, the comments down below. Um, if you ask any questions right now, we're going to hold off until we have a Q&A session when we can answer some of those. So. If you want to add a question and it's relevant to when Nancy Hayes is on, then great, we'll answer it then. Otherwise, hang in there, we'll get back to you. The next segment, I want to introduce uh, kind of an emotional one. Um, we have a Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, I'm going to share some screens, some slides with you and share some quotes. Um, Here's a beautiful picture, though, uh, of Abby, her mom and dad. So there you go. Um, moving along, though, we have Cy passed away in 2020. <clears throat> and it was just real close to before our HOPE conference. And Karen just didn't feel comfortable coming on. And uh, she wasn't ready or able to at that point. That was just a really hard time for her to come and receive a award on behalf of Cy. And so we, as the board of directors, voted to give Cy Rogers the um, Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and I just want to share with you a little bit about, about his life and why. Um, it's Lifetime Achievement Award from Restored Hope is given to someone who actually lives out the faith um, and contribute significantly to, to those who are um, uh, overcoming homosexuality, walking out of it, becoming victors instead of victims. They are experiencing the love of God towards wholeness and freedom from sin, and particularly in the areas of LGBTQ. And so in this case, um, Cy Rogers um, is more than qualified, and here, let me share with you why. Um, there are two kinds of people. Those who believe, who live hope in God will make them happy, and those who live to make God happy. Cy Rogers. Growing up with sexual abuse and gender identity confusion after years of childhood bullying, he embraced a gay identity and a practicing homosexual before, became one, before he was diagnosed as transgender. His life changed course when he became convinced of God's unconditional love and converted to Christianity. Abandoning his plan for sex reassignment surgery, looking for work and finding them, Cy volunteered to serve in a prison ministry. God never ran out of things for me to do, he said in his inauspicious beginnings in ministry in 1980. Cy met his wife, Karen, who served with him in prison. They live cross-culturally on three different 
continents with Psy and full-time Christian service in the next 38 years. Uh, by the way, this was the first Last Day's Ministry newsletter is one of the first um, newsletters I read on the topic of homosexuality as I was coming out of homosexuality in 1982. And so this was the first testimony I saw was size, actually. Um, despite his journey out of homosexuality in 1980, getting married in 82, and starting a family three years later, it seems Psy could never do enough to satisfy his detractors. He often quipped, I find it remarkably ironic that of all the men in the world, God picked me as his public example of redeemed manhood. How very like God to choose the person that no one else would. Isn't that true about God? And by the way, this is Andy in the lower right. <laughs> oh, Andy, <laughs> you had a lot of hair back then, man. Bob Davies in the lower left with the beard and Frank Worthen, who also received a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, So God chose the person that no one else would, but God's version of public relations is different. In, his late eight, in the late 80s, Sai's first foray into vocational ministry was the director of a local parachurch ministry in a fledgling ex-gay movement of Exodus International, which is now defunct. His Orlando, Florida-based ministry provided pastoral care and support groups. And here, by the way, is his daughter, Grace, and that's his lovely wife, Karen. And that's when they began ministry. But he founded a, a ministry that is now called Exchange and still in existence. So in Orlando. Here's on their fourth anniversary in Puerto Rico. In 1991, he was one of 25 pastors on staff with a dynamic Anglican church, Church of Our Savior in Singapore. While he pioneered the work of sexual redemption, founding a recovery ministry that's still in operation there as well, called Choices, Sai's family migrated to New Zealand in 1998, where his itinerant teaching ministry was launched, not before he spent a year in the evangelistic ministry of No Longer Music. He did perform as lead vocalist for a Christian rock operetta, multi-talented man, may I say, uh, that actually played in major secular nightclubs around the world. A gifted communicator, Sai's uh, teaching spanned over three decades. And there's little Grace and Karen, and I believe in Europe right there. Here's some of the things they did. Um, he was a popular conference speaker that actually reached across six continents, apparently not Antarctica, which is the seventh. <laughs> And speaking events were conducted interdenominationally for leadership events, national youth leaders, Bible colleges, Biola, Christ for the Nations, Azusa Pacific Regent, Parachute Musical Festival, which is a youth festival in New Zealand, counselor training, women's conferences, men's events. Sai was also an award-winning talk show host. He was selected for, by Christianity Today as one of the 50 up-and-coming evangelical leaders under 40. Eventually, he returned with his family to Orlando in 2001, where he worked full-time as a teacher and speaker. He traveled four to, to four of six continents per year. Then they returned in 2012 to New Zealand, where he went on staff with Life Church, which is a large church in New Zealand. Often remembered for his gay history, size public teaching ministry transcended the homosexual issue of the past two decades. Over his later years, he mainly spoke about sex in the larger context of conversations on God, sex, and culture. Sai was an evangelist for the character of God, always pointing people to the Bible as their source of God's opinion. I'm not in a ministry of trying to change people. I don't have the power and it misses the point. So well said. That's Sai. I'm in a posture of inviting people to journey with God, Sai said at Fellowship Church. It is in the last two decades that Sai was an apologist for secular, sexual integrity and healthy relationships. He preached in a variety of influential pulpits from Southern Baptist to Presbyterian to Pentecostal. Ed Young's Fellowship in Dallas, Texas. Jenison Gent is in Franklin's Free Chapel in Gainesville, Georgia, to London's Kensington Temple. 
to Australia's Riverview Church. He served as teaching pastor at Christ at Life Church, the largest church in New Zealand, for six years, starting in 2012 while maintaining his international speaking ministry. There is a whole lot more that could be said. He's done so many things. Here's one of a, a wonderful quote. God does not not exist to make me happy. Rather, I exist to make God happy. Get that order right and so much sorts itself out. Eventually. Notice the period after out. Just perfect timing and pointed communication. Upon hearing of his passing, Priscilla Schreier commented on Instagram describing Sai's death as a huge loss for the church and for any of us who knew him. His message and ministry were incredibly unique. His brilliance was astounding. Jenison Franklin described Sai as one of the most informed and skilled speakers we have ever posted. Hillsong founders Brian and Bobby Houston wrote, Sai was truly one of the kindest people you could ever meet. He exemplified grace and freedom and a passion to always bless others. Sai, a leading evangelist for healthy sexuality in the church, died April 19th, 2020, 63 years old after battling kidney cancer for eight months. He defeated cancer once before and had been in remission for five years. He is survived by his wife, Karen, his daughter, Grace, son-in-law, Steve, and actually more than two grandchildren now. He's actually survived by three. Um, here's another wonderful um, quote from Sai. If you stumble in your race, don't quit. We're all tempted to give up and give in and go back to some familiar ditch. It seems easier to do so in the short term, but this could mean forfeiting all that is yet achievable and available to you just up ahead. Perseverance is bigger than failure. Repent, Jesus urged, insisted, declared, still. This is not an insult. It is an invitation and an appeal. To intimacy, may I point back to Gabriel Pagan's testimony. And there's a whole lot more here. Uh, there's a website that you can go to to see more of some of the quotes from Sai. But here are some of the fun pictures uh, that some of our team and brothers and sisters around the world are in. So <sighs> this is a great one too. I just recommend that you check out his website. Um, he's sharing in Singapore here at a youth gathering and people are just responding to the Lord through him. So Grace, Steve and children and new baby Arthur isn't he sweet? So I want to invite Karen up on stage, who is here. Can you hear me, Karen? And yeah. Okay, I can hear you too now. Karen, it is emotional. Even for me, and I'm not, you know, I was just a distant friend to Sai. How are you doing? And uh, it's so well deserved. Um, this is for you in honor of Sai, and it's not just Sai's achievement, it's your achievement also. Because you, he wouldn't have been able to do the things he's done without you. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for serving God by serving Sai and also being the, the wife and mom that you are. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we were a team. Yes. And 18 months before um, he got sick, we traveled and we were, <laughs> we called ourselves um, Gypsies for Jesus. And we were able to uh, we would spend two months in New Zealand, and then two months we traveled. And um, we basically lived out of a suitcase for 18 months and totally prepared, you know. When you're in your 60s, you know, it's not necessarily the time that you think you're going to, you know, pick up and and um, travel like that. But... Um, but we had the grace for it, and as far as we were concerned, this is, you know, this is what we were going to do. And 
Yeah. So and the Lord took him home. I'm happy for him. <laughs> and um a reunion in heaven right now with them. I mean, just think of it. So, oh, I know. Like Frank and many others just uh, Alan yes. Menninger, uh, they're hanging out together. I bet they're having some really good laughs. Well, death in side. heaven, death in heaven means party, kind of like little Arthur. We're we are celebrating his life. We're so happy to see him, and heaven rejoices, you know, upon our death. So they have a big party when we die, and so um, so it's. Adjusting to life, it's a big change. <laughs> um, now I live on 10 acres with ticks and chiggers and snakes and deer. and Chiggers and snakes, not so much. Deer, not a problem. <laughs> so it's a different lifestyle, but here we are. Here we are. Mm. And I'm so grateful you're here with us. I know there will mm. be a day we'll celebrate being together elsewhere. And I look yes. forward to that day the older I get. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I want to see my grandkids and want to be around for them too. But I'm so grateful for you, Karen. And so is everybody else at Restored Hope. The board was delighted unanimously mm. to do this and just honor both you and he. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm so humble. Oh, I don't know about that. I, mean, I don't think it's that. I mean, we're not the queen or anything. <laughs> I'm not the queen. <laughs> but we sure love you, and we wanted to communicate that to you. And we're so appreciative of all that you and Cy together have done over the years. We're grateful for the team that God constructed in the two of you. And um, what a delight to be able to honor you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. For us, Karen. Thank, thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Wow. Okay. Anyhow. <laughs> okay. Let's transition now. I'm going to get my emotions in check and moved over to the next thing. But uh, Karen and Cy are very, very dear. No question about it. No question. So glad to have them. Dr. Nancy Hayes is going to join us soon. Nancy, we're running a little bit behind, so what we might have to do is kind of smush the Q&A session, but you need to take as much time in the, in the keynote as you wish. So um, Nancy Hayes is going to join us. Dr. Nancy Hayes is going to join us and speak on truth. The truth comes out. She's a popular Bible study teacher, author, and speaker. She holds a master's and doctorate degree in pastoral counseling. She's the author of The Truth Comes Out a book describing lessons learned through losing her husband of AIDS and after discovering his secret involvement in homosexual activity and the involvement of her daughter in a high-profile lesbian relationship. I'll say that was very high-profile. <laughs> the, the only out person on TV at the time and your daughter picked her. So that was pretty out there. Nancy, welcome, and thank you for joining us. If she could have got chosen anybody else more famous, I don't know how, uh, but nonetheless. Not at that time, anyway. Not at that particular time. Mm -hmm. I am so glad you're joining us, and I welcome you to take over. I'll be back on stage after introducing you uh, and after your talk, and then we'll go through whatever time we have for Q&A, okay? Well, who knows what my time will be? You know, it's here on paper, and who knows? I'm kind of echoing. Is it because we're on here together? That is a great question. Do you have two tabs open in uh, your browser? If so, you want to just keep the one you're on and shut the other browser. Hmm. Apparently, Stephanie says it's because we're both on. So I'll just turn off my mic and see if you echo then. I don't echo then. Okay, then I guess I'm, I'm all by myself. So I'm happy to be back. And boy, am I touched by these stories with Abby and her mother. I have my Abby, uh, also Abigail. That's a beautiful, beautiful story of family restoration. And um, 
it's a beautiful story of Jesus. It's, I'm so in awe of what Jesus does to redeem lives. And to hear these stories, it's just so beautiful. I, I want to turn my computer around and walk down the street with it for people to hear these stories. It's just, just beautiful. And I bless your family. I bless the families that we've heard testimonies from of healing and restoration. Uh, we all long for that. Some of us are still waiting for that. And we're so grateful. And what I liked, the thing that jumped out at me was when they said they forgave each other. And um, I've had other situations in my life besides my youngest daughter and her situation out, out being out of where we needed to forgive each other. It's, it's not always just about that. So for the, given, the forgiveness message that Abby had was really powerful. Or maybe her mom said that, but the forgiving is so necessary. Um, repenting and forgiving and, and repenting, one of Sai's messages. I have a, a, a loose plan about this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to start out with a couple of truths, and I want to end up with a couple of what I'm calling secrets. They're not really secrets, but a, maybe a secret weapon. Uh, the truths that I wanted to start out with I was thinking about, there are two truths in the kingdom. There's God's truth, and then there's my truth, that sometimes they come together and sometimes they don't. So uh, as Anne said, I wrote uh, the book called The Truth Comes Out. And it wasn't coming out in the traditional way. It was coming out about my own heart. I had had a hard angry heart. My first husband had died of AIDS, as Anne mentioned. So the betrayal of that, my heart was so hard and angry about that whole culture, the whole world of that. And I, I, I was never going to enter that door uh, mentally or emotionally after he died. And then when my youngest daughter came out, I, I had to. And so God talked to me and spoke to my heart in the word uh, Abby talked about the word also, and the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, taking the word, transforming it into my life, changed my heart. Uh, and I'll tell a little story about that at the end. But the, the changing of my heart through the word of God, that was the truth that came out. The most important truth that comes out is truth from the word of God. Uh, God's truth is, and Abby also mentioned this in Romans 8, 28, and I talked about that in my workshop, but I want to talk a little bit about that again, that in, in Romans 8, 28, God's truth is that he wants us to become like Jesus. Everything and everyone that he brings into our life is to make us more like Jesus. And so the Romans 8, 28 verse that we know, we read it earlier, but my paraphrase of it, that God works together with us it's not God waving a magic wand and changing everything in our lives to make us more like Jesus. It's a partnership. The word in the Greek is working together. It's a fellowship. It's an intimate relationship with the Father. He works, we work, and that's what creates our life that makes us more like Jesus. And that's his goal. His ultimate goal is to make us more like Jesus, not to get our family all healed up, although that's a goal, but his first goal, everything and everyone that he brings into our life is to make us more like Jesus. What I see, his, his tool that he uses is the sovereignty of God. I love, I love the sovereignty of God. I love to teach about it. Uh, someone once said, Nancy, your middle name is the sovereignty of God. I, I believe in the sovereignty of God because it's over everything. I, I believe that if I can trust God, and I really believe that he is the sovereign God, then I can trust the people and the things that he brings into my life. I'll give you two definitions of sovereignty of God. First sovereignty of God definition is my definition. The, the sovereignty of God is about God being all of who he is all of the time. It's about God moving heaven and earth on my behalf, he creates in me a heart of worship, and I worship him, and he is everything, he's all love, he's all righteousness, he's all justice, he's all kind, he's all of who he is all of the time. We don't always see him that way, but we see him 
He manifests his sovereignty in all the intricacies of the people and the things that he brings into our life. And we love that. We love that part of God's sovereignty, his power that, that he has brought into our lives. I'm going to adjust this screen just a little bit. Definition number two of God's sovereignty is the Wikipedia definition. Wikipedia says, the sovereignty of God is where God is presented as creator and owner of heaven and earth and has an absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he pleases, subject to none, influenced by none. Well, that's true too. God is all of who he is all of the time. He's He's bringing good things into my life. He's bringing the, diff bringing the difficult things into my life. Some of the things seem to reflect his goodness and his love and his mercy and his grace. And some things seem to reflect his righteousness and his justice. He's that all of the time too. The, the sovereignty of God, however, raises a lot of questions for us. We kind of like where he brings everything good in, but we just wonder why the other things have to be brought in. The other people have to be brought in. We're, we end up with so many questions so that we, we're not so sure we like the part of God's sovereignty where he has absolute right and ownership to do without influence from anybody else. Well, we're not so sure we like that part of it. We're always trying to figure out, you know, why does he do it that way? Does it have to be so hard? Why me? The questions that we've asked, not just about maybe the sexual brokenness that has come into our lives, but other difficult things. I've had, I've had a bunch of other stuff besides that. And I think, does it always have to be so hard? Is there always a refining? Is there always a process to get me to make, to make me more like Jesus? Well, obviously, there's a lot of work to do. It takes a lot of work to make us like Jesus. Someone said that God reveals the work that he does in our lives, he reveals himself with the 80-20 principle. So I want to talk about those two numbers for a minute. The 80-20 principle. God reveals himself using the 80-20 principle. The 80% is mystery and the 20% is the manifestation part. Well, we like the manifestation part. The manifestation part is, is when we get answers. We see God is revealing himself with answers and good things come into our lives. That part of God's sovereignty, we like that part where we see the, our prayers are answered, we get a good job, uh, we have these God moments with people, we have a great coming together with friends or something. We just say God is there. It's a great church moment. God is, God is in it. He's, he's manifesting his goodness, and we love that. We have clarity in questions that we've had, and we have purity in our lives, purity in the lives of our children. We, we like that part of that part of God's manifestation. But I'm, I'm asking you today to buy in with me this 80% part. I'm going to tell you why I think the 80% part is good. It's this mystery, the 80% mystery, and then just a little 20% manifestation. And if you look back over your life, you can probably think about that. Boy, I, I, it seems as if I've had a lot of questions that aren't answered yet. I have a lot of prayers that aren't answered yet. There's a lot of mystery in my life that I, I don't know where, where God is and how am I going to find him in those moments of mystery? What I've learned even this week is that it's in the mystery, in the silence, in the not knowing, in the separation, in the brokenness, is where the where everything, everyone comes together to make me more like Jesus. So think with me a little bit. 
about the moments when you have been brokenhearted and you are with the Lord and you're asking questions. There's so much mystery. There's so much you can't figure out. You don't know why or when or who, which will this ever change? And you're in those moments of mystery. It seems as if God doesn't show up at all. Those are the moments when you begin to have the manifestation, actually the manifestation of the intimacy and the fellowship and the presence and the encounter takes place in the mystery. Uh, we talked about in the workshop, but it's, it's these moments where we are so unsure that drive us to the seeking the answers. We're not going to get the answers in the manifestation. I describe the manifestation, I'll use it this way, as the uh, Psalm 23 moment. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need, everything that I want. The Lord's my shepherd. I'm by quiet waters. Everything's great. And it hardly seems as, as if I already have the promise, goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. Well, that's a good promise. We like that part of God's sovereignty. Surely goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. We like that part. And that's the Psalm 23 moment. What we don't like is these moments of mystery, the Psalm 22 moments. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When? Why? What did I do? What did I do wrong? Why is this happening to me? Those are the dark moments, the mystery moments, the 80% moments. I've described them, I took some scriptural examples of when I think the, the, the surrendering to the mystery has to take place in scripture. It's the, uh, it's about, this is a, the take me to the cross moment. This is the moment when in scripture, the examples of Esther, okay, take me to the king. And if I perish, I perish. Or Ruth, okay, take me to the foreign land. Take me, take me where I don't know whether I'll be welcome because the Moabites are enemies of the Jews. Take me, whither thou goest, I will go. This is Abraham taking that three-day journey. This is a mystery. What is going to happen? Will there be provision? Will there be a ram? Will Lord make the provision? Three days journey. Sometimes we have three years, three decades. We're still waiting on that journey, but in the darkness, in the mystery. My favorite one to think about is John on the Isle of Patmos. He was, he was the best friend of Jesus. He had a prime, prime place in his life. And now when he's 90 years old or so, he's exiled away from friends and family. Talk about mystery. How did this happen to me? How did I get here? Exiled from everybody, really in a prison. But what happens to John in that moment, in those years of mystery? He gets the glorious revelation. He gets revelation in the mystery. He gets intimacy with the Father and with Jesus. He has these beautiful visions of Jesus, beautiful visions of the throne room. The sees one sitting on the throne who has the appearance of appearance of jasper and ruby and rainbow encircled the throne. He has these gorgeous visions of Jesus dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and the, his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance. That's where he gets the revelation, sitting in the mystery, sitting in the unknown, sitting in the how long, when, why, where is everybody? That's when the, that's when the intimacy comes. It's where the presence comes. It's where the healing comes. It's the everything that we might not have chosen, every one that we might not have chosen, every situation that we might not have chosen that God brings together 
partnering with us, working together with us to make us more like Jesus, to have this beautiful fellowship, intimacy, koinonia, fellowship and intimacy, presence with the Father in those moments of mystery. We can come to uh, learn to appreciate those moments. In fact, I think we need to cherish them. I don't know that we have to seek them because the Father brings them into our lives. The, the manifestation, let's just, let's put manifestation on one side of the page, mystery on the other. And let me see if I can just uh, explain a little bit more of how it has affected me in thinking about this. That the manifestation is always the outward signs. It's God's presence. So it's for Abraham when he took the three-day journey. Oh, the ram appeared. Oh, manifestation. When, if you remember the story about Elijah pouring pouring water in all the troughs to ask God to send down fire. He didn't know what was going to happen. And he was, his life was on the line with the prophets of Baal. And he asks God to send fire in these moments of mystery. Will it happen? Won't it happen? And God sends down the fire. Manifestation. It's a glorious moment. Every time we read about it, we think, so awesome. How did this happen? This outward signs, uh, healing him. The woman at the well, she went to the well in mystery, not knowing anything, no intimacy, no fellowship, no presence, no revelation. She goes to the well and she meets Jesus and her whole life has changed. She sees the manifestation of the Messiah right before her very eyes. We love those moments. We love those moments. Um, Restoration, prayers answered. Reconciliation. Psalm 23 moment. The Lord's my shepherd. I have everything I want. It's sight. It's light. It's a God moment. We have these God moments. We love those moments. That's the manifestation. 20% of our experience, according to this, this equation, let's just take this one for example. 20%. The mystery the hiddenness, the silence <clears throat> is Psalm 91. She who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The mystery place is the secret place. It's the questions. It's the tension and the ambiguity and the how long and when and it's Jacob wrestling with the angel. And I won't let you go until I get a blessing. I thought it's a, it's a Lazarus, Martha, and Mary moment. Probably you've asked the same question I have. Why exactly was it that Jesus waited four days? We've had some teaching about that, but that's still a little strange, isn't it? It just seems a little mysterious. And then when he gets there, I was thinking about Mary and Martha. We always have a stereotype for both of them. But I thought Mary had sat in the secret place, in the place of mystery and unknown and tension and silence. But she had, she had sat under the sovereign God, will of God where he would do what he will with his own. And he worked with her. She worked with him in partnership in the secret place so that when he came, she had no accusation against him. Martha had been so busy making sandwiches that weren't asked for, we've sometimes said, that she didn't have time to get into the secret place. She only wanted manifestation, but in the mystery was where Jesus was going to be revealed, where she would work together with the Father so that she would have peace, so that she would get some clarity in the mystery. It happens in the secret place. It's a Psalm 22 moment. So the Psalm 22 comes before Psalm 23. We know that, right? Psalm 22 is the mystery, the questions. I have a lot of questions still. I have a lot of questions. I've had, I've had children who have gone to heaven before me. I've had children who are not walking with the Lord. I've lost two husbands. We've had some terrible tragic, 
tragic accidents in our family. I have a lot of questions. Whoa, it seems as if I've had a lot of stuff. And I know some of you have too. But I'm on this side of it. I'm, I'm partnering with the Father so that I have abundant life. I'm partnering with the Father. I work it out in the secret place. I work it out in the unknown. I sit, in, I sit with him. I sit under the shade tree and get refreshed with apples and raisins like the Shulamite maiden. I sit at his banqueting table where his banner over me is love. I sit in the dark places. I sit in the questioning places. I sit in the places where there aren't any answers, where prayers are still seem to be unanswered. At least from what I can see, Abby said to her mom, you know, there were things that going on that you didn't know yet that were going on behind the scenes. Well, I know he's always working behind the scenes because that's our sovereign God. And he's working all these things and all these people to come into my life to make me more like Jesus. But it happens, the revelation, the presence the, the peace comes, the Psalm 23 moment comes after the Psalm 22 moment. So I invite you to cherish the, 20, the Psalm 22 moments because Psalm 23 will come if you will sit with the Father, when you sit with the Father, when you sit in the secret place. I said I would uh, give you a secret tool that uh, was part of what took me from always thinking I needed or should have manifestation and took me to a place where I could embrace the mystery. And some of you have read this in my book. Uh, I've taught, I have taught this. If you've been any place in my vicinity in the last 10 or 12 years, you have heard me teach on this. Um, teaching on the blessing, how important the blessing is. That when, when nothing is changing in your life, where you have sat in the secret place, where you have sat with the mystery, you have had some manifestation and you're growing in your partnership. You are working, partnering together with God to make you more like Jesus so that when you're more like Jesus, the people around you can... In, uh, encounter Jesus with you, as long as you're doing the work, the, the blessing is what you can do and give. So I'll tell you the story about the blessing for me and why it meant so much to me. I was uh, in a small plane uh, flying from Chicago to Nantucket to visit my grandchildren. And I was reading in scripture. God always speaks to me where I'm reading for Bible study at home. So I was in Acts chapter three, and I was right at the end of the chapter, Acts uh, 3.26. And when I read it, it's the last verse, I thought, I didn't, that verse had never clicked on me. You know how the Holy Spirit highlights a verse sometimes. So this verse says, God raised up his servant, Jesus, and he sent him to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Have you ever read that verse? Have you ever read that verse like that? God raised up Jesus and he sent him to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Now I know I'm taking it out of context. So if you're a Bible scholar and you want to challenge me on that, I'll tell you just why this worked for me at that time. And I thought, hmm, well, let's see. He blessed me by turning me from my wicked ways. That means, well, that must have happened. Well, it didn't happen before Jesus. It didn't happen when Jesus was on the earth. That, that means he must have done it before the foundation of the world. He blessed me before the foundation of the world to turn me from my wicked ways. So he had my life predetermined, predestined. And part of it was to bless me and turn me from my wicked ways. And I thought, well, you know who else he's blessed? <laughs> He's, he's, that means he's blessed your daughter, too. And I thought, well, I, when I read this, I thought, well, I've, I can't ever bless her. You know, I'm a Christian, and if I bless her, it would look like I'm agreeing with what she is doing, and I didn't agree with her. But I wanted relationship with her. This was, this was a few years ago, and it was 
this was still a quiet part of the world, except in her world where it blew up internationally. Otherwise, it was kind of quiet. Everybody didn't talk about homosexuality all the time. I thought, but he blessed her also. Well, so I guess I better bless her. First, I had to confess, confess my hard heart, and I had to repent of my hatred and anger toward that whole community. And then I blessed her. And I blessed her friends. And I thought, okay, well, thank you, Lord. So when I got to Nantucket, we went to the beach the next morning. I went with my grandchildren. And some friends came up to me and said, oh, we heard they broke up. Well, I knew who they met. And I said, well, I just talked to them a couple of days ago. I don't know. I don't think so. And they said, well, it was on the news this morning. So I thought, okay, well, when I get home, I'll call them. We didn't have cell phones then so much. And I called and they had broken up. When I used to tell this story, I would say, this was not a magic wand. This was not in the plane. I called up some ooga booga voodoo and they broke up. I'd been praying for this for three and a half years. So it wasn't overnight. So I went back and I thought, well, what happened in that plane? What happened was me. What happened was God changed my heart through the scripture, through that word about blessing, which is where all my heart change came was from the word of God. When that blessing came to me from the Holy Spirit and I could bless her, my heart changed. I, I don't know what happened in their hearts. That has something happened in the relationship, obviously. And I did talk to them and found out a little bit, but it was a it was a long story. But what happened, what I want you to see is that the blessing happened when I forgave, repented of my hard heart. I forgave the hurt that I had received and I blessed her and I blessed her friends. So I'm gonna promise you that the blessing always works. And here's what I learned. Uh, when I went home, uh, well, I, there are two parts of the blessing. When I went home, I did, did a little more study on the blessing because I saw that it was very powerful. And what I learned, one definition in my concordance and lexicon was to bless is to ask God, now when we bless somebody, we want something to happen, don't we? We probably say it very casually sometimes, but really when we think about it, we want something to happen. So when we bless, we're asking God to interfere in somebody's life, to do something, for him to do something because we really don't know what to do, especially with our family, we really don't know what to do. So we ask him to interfere, for him to do something, to bring them into the right relationship with himself. I should tell you to get a piece of paper because every time I do this, someone says, oh, slow down so I can write it down. So he asks, we're asking God to interfere in someone's life for him to take action in their lives because we don't know what to do. For him to bring them into the right relationship with himself. Well, you see, that's what he did with me. He brought me into the right relationship, the relationship of blessing instead of cursing. And when God releases his power, he changes, when he releases his blessing, he releases his power to change the character and destiny of the one being blessed. Okay, now hear me again. When he releases his blessing, his power is released to change their character and their destiny. The root of that teaching is with Jacob and Esau. And you probably remember how terrific, horrific it was for Esau when he didn't get a blessing because the blessing from the father actually determined the character and destiny of the sons. So when we bless, we're asking God to interfere, asking God to take action in their lives, to bring someone into the right relationship with himself. When God releases his power, he changes their character and their destiny. And that's what he did for me. My whole life about the whole homosexual world took a turn into doing some ministry in that world. So it was a, a big a character change for me 
my I, I was done with my anger. I had forgiven it. I had confessed and I was done with not forgiving and for cursing because the opposite of blessing, if we're saying unkind things, if we're accusing, if we're taking the part of Satan, accusing them, we are becoming the ones who curse them and we are determining their character and their destiny. We know this, the power of words, power, life and death are in the power of the words. Uh, another, another. Uh, I've read someone else about the blessing, and I loved what she says. She says the power invokes God's presence. This is this is what we're saying when we're blessing someone. Re release your power. Invoke your presence. Infuse your provision into their lives. You've probably said God bless you a million times to people, and you're just saying God bless you. I used to say, God bless you to my children, my grandchildren. I would drop them off at school and I'd say, bye, honey, I love you. God bless you. And that's what they heard. I love you. God bless you. But what was I saying? I was asking God to interfere in their lives, for God to invoke his presence in their life. I'm invoking his presence in their life. I want him to infuse his provision in their life. I want him to take action in their lives and I want him to bring them into right relationship with himself. I want him to release his power to change their character and their destiny. They hear me, bye, honey, I love you. But I'm saying, God bless you. And that's what I mean. So when you're blessing somebody, I can promise you there will be change. The thing that happens, here's the two promises about the blessing. It always works, whether you see it or not. I took on the habit, the discipline of walking down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and I would just say under my breath, God bless you to everybody I passed. I have no idea. The people in the airport that I've passed and I've said, God bless you, I, I don't know what will happen, but I, I know what I'm saying, and I'm assuming, I'm trusting that God is responding to my prayer, my heartfelt prayer that would he bless them. So I can promise you that something will happen whether you see it or not but I can promise you that it will always work on you. When you bless someone, you will get the reward of it. It might not be what you expected, but you have co-labored with the Father. You ask him, you're, he's giving it, you're saying it. You co-labored with him to bring his presence, his provision, his blessing, his power, the change of character and destiny in their lives by the blessing that you speak over them. So I invite you to just go around, go around your neighborhood, go around your church, go around the streets of your city, go into the stores, just bless people as you see them. And when you say, God bless you to somebody, you smile at them and you give them that blessing. I'm saying it's the best way that we can move ourselves out of mystery it's not going to answer all of our questions, but we're out of the mystery, out of what we've received while we've been in the Psalm 22 moments, while we've been in the exile with John, when, while we've been in the three-day journey with Abraham, when we've been with Esther with her handmaidens, fasting and praying. When we've been in those times, we will be able to come out with a blessing and we will be able to manifest what we have learned in Psalm 22, we will manifest a Psalm 23 life over the lives of the people that we want to influence. Our strong, healthy life will make a strong, healthy family and healthy friends, healthy church, healthy culture. I'm saying it's about you. It's not about people out here, but this is about you and your co-labor with the Father that will bring glory to him. You will manifest his presence and you will have the blessing of encounter and intimacy. You will have fellowship with the Father that you maybe have never experienced before as you sit in the mystery, in the hiddenness, in the silence. I invite you in, come in, and I bless you. I'd like to do that. How about, would you like to receive a blessing? Let's do that real quickly. I think we have time. Hold out your hands. And I'm going to bless you if you would like to be blessed. Father, you know what's going to happen. Father, I ask you to bless these all these wonderful people, the listeners, the hearers. Bless them. I ask you to interfere in their lives. Take action in their lives. Bring them into the right relationship with you. Infuse 
your pres in part your presence, infuse your provision. Release your power to change their character and their destiny. We ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. But before we're finished, why don't you turn your hands over and let's give a blessing to the people who are on your heart. Father, we have a lot of people, names, faces going through our minds and our hearts right now. And we come out of that place of having fellowshiped with you, encountered with you, an intimate relationship with you, presence with you. We come out of that place and we give a blessing. We say, bless them. Bring your presence upon them. Interfere in their lives. Take action in their lives. We don't have a clue what to do anymore. You take action, Lord. Bring them into the right relationship with yourself. Release your power to change their character and their destiny. Amen. And I bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anne, for re renewed hope. It's a very hopeful day today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs>
self-harm, what I've noticed is that recently people who are in, feel very disconnected or on the autism spectrum have been really kind of trying to grasp hold of meaning in life and oh it must be because I'm trans and that would fix everything if only I was the opposite sex. Abigail Schreier came out with a book called Irreversible Damage. Um, it's a little girl a doll with a womb cut out and kids are being funneled down this trans pathway as a solution because of trans activism on social media. Like being trans is a solution to every problem. And then they just come up with these broad categories like, do you feel anxiety? Do you, are you depressed? Oh, you must be trans. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel disconnected? Oh, it must be because you're trans. Um, what response would you have and what would you recommend for this mom who's concerned about her daughter? Uh, that's a tough one and it's, it's, it's very a tough one current. and I, I don't it's so current and I don't like to sound like a broken record but I am really strong on we have to get healthy I cannot live my if I had lived my life based on my daughter's it gets more wild and crazy sometimes I I, I I, I can't do that. I cannot live my life around my children. The heartache of that, I haven't had that heartache. And so I don't want to make light of it, but I know that I have to be in the secret place. The way I can deal with anything is in the secret place. And, and, and you know, I've had a lot of stuff in my life. I, the only way I can deal with it is in the secret place. Does it answer my question for my child? Well, I have to give that up sooner or later. Doesn't everybody want the story of Abby and her mom? That was a beautiful, beautiful story. And again, the, the women giving their testimonies have just been beautiful. The men have too, but I guess the women have touched my heart more, Brenna and Abby. They're beautiful stories of restoration and reconciliation and new life and their commitment to Jesus and commitment to the word and teaching truth to others. It's, it's so beautiful. That's what we all want. It may not end like that. And I, one thing I guess I didn't say, we never know the end of the story. We don't know the end of the story for anybody else. But for us, we must be committed to a private, quiet, secret life with the Lord for ourselves. I, if, if, it, it's all about us in that moment. If we, if we can get right with the Lord and trust the sovereignty of God, that the sovereign God brings into our life everything and everyone to make us like Jesus. That's what he wants most for the mom and for the daughter. But since the mom is asking the questions, she's the one who's going to have to do the work right now. To partner with the father in the secret place, in the crying, in the weeping, in the, in the garden. Is this ever going to end? And all the questions, a three-day journey with Abraham. What in the world does this mean? Am I going to have to sacrifice my only son? He was ready to go. We have to be ready to give our children up and live our life with Jesus and trust that the sovereign God has brought it into our lives to make us like Jesus. I, it's a broken record for me, but it's what I've said. I have been teaching that for that's always my message. It's about you getting right with the Lord. I'm not saying she's getting solid with the Lord, intimate with the Lord in the secret place. It seems like what I've seen, what you're talking about is what I've seen in almost every parent who's sought help for their loved one or who's joined a parent group with Restored Hope or back in the day with Exodus. It mm -hmm. seems as if God is deepening their walk with him He's Amen. pulling them into intimacy. He's drawing them in. He's making them healthier. And then their child becomes secondary. But it takes that to get them to that I place. think so, Anne. Absolutely. And it seems like crisis, you know. There's some kind of, um, it's a crisis that we can't control that draws us into greater intimacy with the Father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what your main point. That's good. A crisis that we can't control. But... We live under the sovereign hand of God who is in control. Exactly. All in love with the sovereign God. <laughs> Fall in love with sovereignty. Right. And I also want to point out to that uh, mom and some of you who are on this call, 
Um, one of our pastoral affiliates, Linda Seiler, Dr. Linda Seiler has um, read this book called Desist, Detrans, Detox by Marie Keffler of, what is the name? She's with um, Partners in Ethical Care. And she has come up with a book that's covering uh, how to uh, detox from the trans culture that's going online. So just an FYI, there is some material out there, particularly on this topic, and there's a whole bunch more on the topic of trans on our website. Dr. Linda Seiler is one of those people who answers this question head on because she identified as a young person as she wanted to be David as a little girl and um, mm. ended up surrendering to the heart of the father and um, has quite a testimony herself along those lines. So just an FYI, Dr. Linda Seiler, lindaseiler.com is her website about trans information. We also have under resources on our website, restoredhopenetwork.org, if you go to the menu at the top and choose resources, there's a whole page I've constructed on trans resources. Mm. So please do check that out. Um, okay, the other question in here is how do you stop blaming yourself as a mom and staying in a bad marriage and damaging your children? And so um, Tara asked this, I think this is a pretty profound question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've come to my own conclusions about um, what do you do with guilt, shame? I mean, nobody's a perfect parent on this side of heaven, at least in human flesh other than Jesus. Um, so, and he didn't birth biological children. He wasn't part of that process. Um, so what are your thoughts on how a parent can cope with guilt and shame of a loved one who's being LGBT identified? It's hard. It's hard not to blame ourselves. When I started, I think I said this earlier, when I started back to school to get a degree in counseling, I learned how much counseling I needed. And I just bemoaned the fact of all the things I had missed with my children and what a terrible mother I had been. And oh dear, really, it was, it was a, a serious confrontation to see how I could have done things differently. So that's always the case. I'm gonna go back again. God brings everything and everyone into our life to make us more like Jesus. So the things that we don't understand are the things, so we're talking about shame or guilt right now. You don't have to carry those things. Jesus already did that work. So you have to put that on. You, I, I didn't pick up my cross. You pick up your cross and see that Jesus has already taken your guilt and your shame, Tara. He's already taken the guilt and the shame. You do not have to carry that. Please, my darling, you do not have to carry that. And it doesn't change anything, does it? It doesn't make the marriage better or it doesn't make what you did before any better. It's still there. So you carry the cross. You let Jesus carry the cross, cover it with his blood, and you move on free in Jesus. I, I know it sounds like a quick fix. I'm not talking about that. Get into the secret place. Give it to Jesus. Let him know that he carries all your shame, all your guilt, and then you can be free. And then you, it's in that secret place. You work with Jesus. Think about Esther. Think about Abigail. Think, well, I don't know if you were on the workshop or not. You think of the people in scripture who went to the secret place, not knowing the outcome, but they learned, they learned presence. They learned encounter. They learned intimacy with the Father. That's all you need. That's all you want is intimacy with the Father. You want presence. You want encounter. Get to the word. Get on your knees. Get in the garden. Give your guilt and shame to Jesus. And I bless you right now. I just bless you that you will have the peace of Jesus, that you will find peace from him, that he has covered you with his blood, that he has taken all your guilt and shame. He has a plan for your life. Cliche, I know, but he does. And it's to bring you and all the people and all the things in your life together to make you like Jesus. And you're on the way. When you ask the question, you're on the way. So I bless you with that. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you so much, Nancy. I sure appreciate you sharing <laughs> and um, teaching and speaking and being present with us. And we're grateful. Um, what a great pleasure. And 
Let, let me just pray for you as we move Excellent. on. May I? Excellent. I'd love it. Thank you. Oh, Lord. Thank you so much for Nancy. Thank you for the woman of God that she is. Thank you for her love for you. Thank you for her finding a place where she can heal, where she can grow, mm -hmm. and how she's transmitted that beautiful place to the rest of those who hear and those who see her. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining her, putting her yes. in a secret garden, so to speak. Amen. Lord, you hid her under your wing because yes. that, there were fiery darts coming from every, which ang every angle. And so, Lord, regardless of any fiery dart, regardless of residual things, Lord, I ask that you would strengthen her, that you would bless her, that you would give her even greater and greater freedom in Christ, as, long, mm -hmm. as well as everybody else who's on this call, including me. And Amen. so thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are God, that you have the answer, that you are the Amen. one. Amen. And we worship you. Yes. Praise you. Bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I say yes, one thing? thing? Yeah. Um, I did the book my a uh, few years, but Joe Dallas and I did a book together. And I know he's teaching and traveling about it. And I still get some some royalties from that book, but he's doing all the work. So I might not have a chance to see Joe or talk to him, but I want him to know that I appreciate that because he's he's uh, providing for me in some small way. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Nancy. Thank you. And I know Joe heard this, and um, I'll make sure that he did if he didn't. So. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Thanks Thank for you. asking me. It's lovely to be with you. It was wonderful to be with you. I wish we were in person, but another time. Please, in yeah. person. I'd love yeah. to see you. Oh, it would be a delight. Take good care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Lord, for each of these saints who have come to share uh, with the people who are attending today. So, Lord, thank you. Um, the next segment is a pretty special one. It is something that was born last year, essentially. It is special guests joining us on stage. Last year, we had a number of different people and this year we'll have uh, some some others and so if you could uh, bring Deborah up on stage that'd be great uh, Deborah Barr is on the board of Restored Hope and a friend of mine um, she serves as vice chair on the board director of a ministry called All Things New at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden Maryland she's ordained minister holds a Master of Divinity from Denver Seminary and she and I are going to visit and then visit with her uh, pastor, who's her mentor as well, uh, Pastor John Jenkins. So hopefully she'll be up here soon. The stream was unable to connect. I'm here. Due to a network error. So Deborah, you're not able to get up here yet. I am. I'm grateful Pastor Jenkins is on the call. I'm sorry that um, Deborah's not here with us, Pastor Jenkins. She's I'm here. a pretty significant person, and I cannot hear you. I'm here. Um, I can see you and Pastor. Deborah's on. Yes. Deborah? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you. You I see Deborah and I don't. Okay, hang on just one second. I'm going to refresh my screen. Oh, you can see and hear her, and I can't hear anybody. Okay, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> I can hear you now. I know that's Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I, I'm so grateful, even with Oscar barking. He's a little guy who's at uh, Deborah's house. Um, I just want to mention that Pastor Jenkins has an enormous bio. If you guys ever get a chance to, please go to First Baptist Glen Arden and uh, visit his website. You have done an awful lot for the kingdom of God, and I have to tell you that I'm grateful for one particular part of it, Pastor Jenkins, and that is mentoring, pulling Deborah under your wing, making her part of your family. And, um, and thank you. Thank you for serving Jesus through serving so many. But here's one in particular I'm, I'm particularly grateful. Well, thank you. Uh, Deborah has been a joy to 
make her part of our family. That's what she is. She's a part of our family. We treat her like my, my like our daughter, my wife and I. We love her dearly and deeply. And she's made an incredible impact upon our ministry and upon the lives of so many people in our church who have struggled in various areas, particularly in this area. And uh, we're very proud of her and I'm honored to have her on our team and in our family. I remember hearing, I remember hearing about um, Deborah really wanted to go overseas and she got an offer from somebody that wasn't legit and you stepped in the gap and how you responded to her showed such a fatherly heart towards her. Deborah, do you want to recount that at all? Yeah, I got a invitation to go to England and thought it was legitimate, but it ended up being a scam. And I was so excited about going overseas because that's my heart. I minister to people overseas this way on Zoom or on you know virtual platforms, but I love traveling and really wanted to be there. And I was almost pushing past all of the things that were all the little warning signs that were like, warning, warning, this is a problem. And I, of course, talked to my pastor about it. And he helped to confirm that, that it was not legitimate and don't go down that path. And so I, I just love my pastor and all that he has done for me personally. And he's such a champion for people that hurt. And he's so willing to allow all the types of ministries like my ministry to be in the church because the church is a hospital for hurting people. And yeah. the, the message that I heard when Deborah communicated that to me, Pastor Jenkins, was, oh, honey, don't go down there. It felt <laughs> like, seriously, an arm around her like a daughter of danger, warning, don't go there. It just was... It was so precious with how mm. she communicated it. I heard your father heart in, in oh, that. So bless her I, heart. And um, just to give you a mini bio of Pastor Jenkins, he's a senior. He is the senior pastor of First Baptist Church Glen Arden in Maryland, um, it, which is, by the way, enormous. Just an FYI to everybody else. I, I just want to brag on his church a little bit. Um, honestly, I was there with Deborah and. They're like your sanctuary seats, approximately 20,000 people. It felt like maybe 500,000. I don't know. <laughs> just, it's, it's huge. Uh, but I was just so blessed by being there and your very personal touch afterwards and greeting anybody who walked down and even took a picture with me. I don't think you remember, but. I remember, <laughs> so, uh, but he's done so many other things, you guys. He's also, I am thrilled he's on our board of reference and provided space for Deborah's uh, ministry. What is it that, that, what provoked you to have a heart to keep open the doors for people who want to leave homosexuality? What, what opened your heart to Deborah's type of ministry? Well, it's, it's the message of the gospel. It is a message of hope to people who are struggling and, and uh, having difficult, difficulty in an arena that the world says, it's okay, walk on down that road, live that life. But the Bible is crystal clear that this is not, you know, ordained to be the will of God for people. It's bondage. It's, uh, it's a stronghold. And uh, I have a heart to help people get out of their strongholds and out of their bondages and to experience the freedom that only Jesus has to offer. And uh, Deborah's testimony and her journey testifies to that. And we just want other people to have that same experience and that same journey. If they want freedom, if they want to come out of that lifestyle and experience the real love and joy that God has to offer, Christ makes it available. And we, we, we try to do that for uh, anybody who wants, who wants change. I love that. I love that. And I love your heart. I love your heart for the truth, for the gospel, for hope. Um, Deborah, anything you want to ask Pastor Jenkins or thank him or just communicate your heart towards him at the moment? Yeah, I just want to thank him personally and for all of the people in First Baptist Church of Glen Arden all around the world that um, are just so blessed by hearing the truth and being under your leadership and your covering. You're an amazing leader. You're an amazing pastor, and I love you very much. 
And I want to thank her. She said it exactly the way I wrote it out for her. So I'm going to have to pay her for saying all those things she told about me. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think that was genuine, but I understand yeah, it it's was. difficult. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Jenkins, so much. And um, we're hoping in the future that you'll join one of the board meetings and spend a half hour to 40 minutes, however much time you'd like to devote with us. I want to extend an, uh, an official offer for you to join us when it's convenient for your schedule. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to do that, and uh, I'll have De Deborah get with my, get, get with my uh, assistant and see how we can make that happen. For such a busy man, thank you for making space. I can't tell honor. you how much that means to me. Thank you, sir. All right. God bless you all. Bless you. Thank you. So Deborah, I'm gonna invite the next person up on stage. You're welcome to stay if you'd like. You don't you may not know her yet though. Dr. I'll head Ann, Okay, Dr. Ann Gillies is gonna come up on stage. She is trained jointly in professional counseling and theology, earning a PhD in philosophy of professional counseling. Wow. Uh, most of her degrees were at Liberty, I believe. So you can clarify that in a second, Dr. Ann. Her career focused on clients with complex trauma, and she is now on the Canadian front lines in a fight against conversion therapy bans. Her passion is for children caught in a web of deception. Dr. Ann Gillies, welcome. It's wonderful to see you, and I think I'll see you next month, too. Hey, uh, we're going to be rooming together, so hey, get ready for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Here we go. Um, so, just, just Hopefully I can get back to Canada with our wonderful COVID lockdowns. But anyways, that's a little bit different. Right. So I missed that. Will you have to quarantine? I don't know. I'm not just sure. Everything's up in the air. But I'm, I'm very happy to be with you today. And uh, yeah, really enjoy what I'm hearing. Fantastic. Um, yeah, if my team could type in their name, uh, people who are on the screen, into the chat, that would be amazing. Um, Dr. Ann Gillies, G-I-L-L-I-E-S, yes. uh, Restoring the Mosaic. And by the way, her button is on the screen. It's green on my screen. It says Restoring the Mosaic. If you click that, it'll take you boom, right over to her uh, website. So you can learn more about her there. Um, you have been on the front lines against the bill called C6, which actually would forbid belief as well as practice in, in the country of Canada. That's a big deal. Um, what do you think is gonna, I know they put it on a tabling uh, timeline right now because elections are coming up and they wanna use it as a battering ram in their, in their arguments as they're putting out ads and what have you to get reelected. So what do you think's going on and how how can we still minister or what's the best thing to do from your perspective? Well, it's a good question what's going on. Um, I was just on a call today to an MP's office and we have actually scheduled uh, the press conference as we've been waiting for a long time to schedule because the bill is back in the house now for third reading and it is to be voted on. This is speculative, um, but their best information is, is going to be voted on on Wednesday. And because um, our Liberal government and we have an NDP um, party and a Green party and then our Conservative party, but the three other parties, other Conservative parties are all in favor of this. And many, many of the Conservative members are also in favor because as in most of these conversion therapy um, bylaws and bans, the wording is so, um, it, it's just incredibly vague. And it means right now that people like me, so therapists or pastors, leaders, in, could be subject not only to fines, but to uh, criminal charges and to spend up to five years in jail just for helping someone who asks for help with unwanted same-sex attraction if they are someone who perhaps is in, um, has severe addictions and it's created um, 
problems, incarceration, those kind of things. We cannot help that person if they are same-sex attraction, but if they are heterosexually attracted, we can help them. So it's very discriminatory. We expect the bill to go through and it, see, we're still in this place, like you said, and about it being a political tool. So right now in Canada, we are really in a, a place of darkness and there are organizations that have been helping uh, those with same-sex attraction that are actually leaving Canada it's going to this ban is going to really limit what can be said and because it also talks about advertising um, you cannot advertise let me just read this to you um, that anyone who knowingly advertises an offer to provide conversion therapy so conversion therapy is talk therapy basically right any kind of therapeutic techniques sex addiction therapy anything uh, to someone or that advertises even by word of mouth, even by word of mouth, that that person can face criminal charges. So we're in a really bad place. It's a very dark place with what's happening with the LGBT, and I will call it an agenda uh, over Canada. In fact, and I don't know if you've uh, read this or seen this, we have just, uh, in Canada, the LGBT have claimed now, not the month, just the month of June to be Pride Month, they are calling um, it a season of pride from June till September. So well, celebrations are going, going on. on. And, and you, you know, know what? what? I am I not anti-gay, but I am anti-activist that promote something that is not constructive to our children, and especially in the area of the transgender dysphoria. Um, there's so much, so much that's so harmful in our educational system. So we love people, but we really need to keep exposing the darkness and telling the truth with love and kindness. And it seems as if they're not really after a technique. They're after limiting or eliminating a goal for LGBT identified persons. So it's not about electroshock or whatever it is that they put claims out on, which, gosh, from what I've heard in the 1950s, there may have been electroshock used in psychiatric hospital settings, uh, but for who knows what, I mean, not specifically this, for everything. So <clears throat> the 1950s, praise God, are done. <laughs> well, so, and in Canada, I mean, yeah. it has been used in decades, and we are, we are, you know, there were, there are laws in Canada already that prevent any kind of therapy that would be harmful. But what they're talking about too is any kind of a suggestion that so we can't help people reduce or repress non-heterosexual attraction or behavior, that's part of this uh, bill. We cannot help people to reduce or, ret or, or repress. That means that anyone coming that says they want to reduce their behavior or their attractions, and it's same-sex identified, um, they, they are not allowed to. So if they are he into heavy porn, and it's homosexual porn, lesbian porn, we can't help them. How discriminatory How is that? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. Well, we they can, want help. It's not about they want help. We can't, we can't support, support their, their decisions, decisions on the, on the goals, goals, the direction of their goals. So self-determination goes gets thrown out the window, which yeah. is the whole point that kept the door open for care in the first place. Self-determination, well, I decide what my goal is as a client. I bring it to a counselor. The counselor decides if they can help me with it or not. Right, so that's the principle of professional therapy, right? Absolutely. But in this case, you bring something at all related to LGBT and people are gonna have to refuse it or risk 10 years in prison, potentially, yes, yes. and massive financial fines. So okay. they're gonna lose their jobs. It, you can't even be a pastor if you have a criminal background in Canada, is that correct? I'm pretty, I'm sure, pretty that's sure that's correct. correct. That's Absolutely. what I've been told by Jose. So yes, yes. Jose Ruba, who's up there, they asked a question and this will be the last question because I'm running behind, it turns <laughs> out. So uh, is, uh, 
yeah, these are serious things, you guys. We need to pray for Canada. Pray for Canada, but not just Canada. We need to pray for the U.S. Yes. Because the Equality Act is aligned with that overarching international goal. It's the same activists. They're just taking it and throwing it in different formats that they can get through. Uh, Australia has already had one pass, yes. and it is dangerous. If someone's referred outside the country by someone within Australia, they can also be under those fines. So if somebody from Canada wants help and they come and they don't mention anything, we can help them. Uh, but if somebody refers them to us, they could be in trouble in Canada. Well, right? you cannot take your child across the border from Canada to the adult. U.S. Yeah. Uh, and, and because then the parent, I think, will actually be charged in that case. In custody, yeah. Um, and everything oh, else is atrocious. on the line. So it's a dangerous time. Uh, so pray for Canada. But pray for the rest of the world too, folks. Oh. Um, what we care about is that people get the care that they want. Um, we're not into coercing anybody to do anything, just FYI. Um, and nor is the counselor, nor are the counselors in Canada. So thank you so much, Dr. Gillies, for joining us. I sure appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. I know I will. It's great to be here. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Take care. Everyone. Take care. So there's a lot going on in this world, but right now I have another world changer, Elizabeth Woning, going to join me. She's co-founder of Equip to Love and of the Change Movement. She came out, of, uh, came out to lesbianism in her early 20s, attended a Presbyterian Church USA seminary, openly lesbian, and uh, as a student in seminary, she lobbied for marriage ordination of LGBTQ identified individuals ministered amongst gay identified youth, espousing a theology that embraced homosexuality, though God had other plans. So upon graduating, she served as a youth pastor in a rural community where an encounter with Jesus radically shifted all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. Can you share a little bit about what in the world? <laughs> God did some amazing stuff. And I just, I wanna say about this uh, lady, that she is a friend first and yeah. she's also very deep theologically thoughtful she just grapples with things comes up with another comes up with another angle and it's it's just delightful to be around you elizabeth thank you you're a gift <laughs> thank you so much can you flesh out a little bit of that story so other people can know what in the world happened you went to the country and then boom yeah <laughs> Well, so I, when I graduated from seminary, I moved from a major metropolitan area where I was doing ministry in the gay community um, and then moved down to the fringe of the Bible Belt to a rural community. And uh, in that setting came across charismatic Christians. And I, I had, I think at that point in my life, I had a strongly academically informed social justice driven perspective of the gospel. And when I, uh, when I moved into this rural area, I came across some charismatic Christians. In fact, so a local youth pastor saw me at the time. And, um, you know, at that point in my life, I didn't, I didn't own or wear women's clothes. I was I was very butch. Um, I shaved my head mostly. I have several piercings and some tattoos, and so. Um, so one of these days you're gonna have to see. <laughs> um, so I he he looked at me and he thought, well, there's someone the Lord wants me to witness to, and so he walked up to me to share the gospel, and I was in the midst of pulling away in my truck with my human rights campaign stickers and prize stickers on the back, and he said, where are you headed? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor and I'm headed to my office at church. And you could just see that it, it was like, does not compute. It was his face just went completely blank. It was like, I have no idea what is happening here. <laughs> and so um, that began uh, some very intense conversations. And he ended up inviting me to his youth outreach. And that's where um, I saw for the first time the power of the Holy Spirit. So I was there with junior high and high school students and the Holy Spirit was moving and 
a 17 year old boy approached me with uh, what he called a word from the Lord. And that was completely outside of my box of operation. And so upon hearing that, I remember just thinking, is it possible that God knows specifically who I am? Because if that's the case, I don't know who God is. And so it caused me to begin rereading the Bible. So I picked up a new Bible and I highlighted uh, every place in the Bible where God described himself. I wasn't looking for is homosexuality sin. I, I was not convicted of sexual sin at that time. Um, I wasn't looking for myself or what should I do? I was really just looking for who is God. And that eight, it would took me about a year and a half to read the Bible and to begin formulating a new understanding of who God was. And really it was, I would say in the midst of that journey that I started seeing this incredible, transcendent, beautiful God that I had somehow missed. And then I was surrounded by people who were claiming they could interact with the love of God. I, I had never, I never experienced, experienced that, that before. And so um, I was really provoked by my, my new friends. But then also as I saw God, I, I experienced what John Calvin says, uh, when you see God as he is, you come to see yourself as you are. And I was coming into touch with a reality in my own life that I wasn't familiar with. And among those things, I began exploring the reality that lesbianism as I had studied it and understood it to be in scripture, um, really wasn't well represented. And that caused me to question, well, what does it mean to be a woman? Why do I have, what does lesbianism add to my life that should I let go of that label, uh, I couldn't carry on. And so I, I had this little existential crisis, really, this conflict of understanding that lesbianism was more to me than my Christian faith. And um, it, it gave power to me, it gave meaning to my life. Um, it, it gave me a sense of identity and purpose. Letting go of that and identifying as just a woman felt like a, a letdown. And um, that was the beginning of my journey out of the LGBT world. And obviously, I wish we had a, a zillion more minutes, but we're actually running over quite a bit. So yeah, yeah. I'm trying to stay on task, but Guys, we're going to go over a few. We have a greeting from Dr. Michael Brown right after this. Um, and then Deborah Barr is going to close us in prayer. So <clears throat> um, fast forward a whole bunch. And these years are so important in your life story. I hope that you will join us again and give us your full testimony. Mm, uh, that would be wonderful. Not today. But would you sometime? Would you? Oh, no, I would love that. that. Okay, yeah. that would be as my son laughs at me, I, I tell him that would be way awesome. So <laughs> way uh, awesome. there's the Southern California <laughs> in me someplace. Uh, but Elizabeth, we, we need to hear more from you. I want Thank to hear you. more from you. And I know that God has much to share through you. So Thank I would you. like our listeners to hear from you at some point and, and hear deeply, not just for a few moments. So I wanted uh, to introduce you, so much. you to everybody. And i um, grateful that you're a friend um, and that you are a mover and shaker. God's put you in position, given you experience so that you can cross boundaries and, and talk through barriers that um, many of us, if we hadn't had that experience, wouldn't be able to do. We can't do mm -hmm. it because we haven't had that lived experience like you have. Right. Um, and so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for doing what you're doing for the Lord and for knowing him. It's seriously, you guys do want to hear more for sure. I'm looking at the <laughs> chat as we're talking, um, definitely. So yeah. thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. Thank you, and thank you for all that Restored Hope is doing. And um, this conference and many others are so vital for the time that we are living in right now. And there's a whole lot of room for a lot more work. Um, there's more work than any one of us can do separately. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful for all that you do through Changed and um, interaction with uh, Moral Revolution and Bethel mm -hmm. and yeah. ministry left and right. So I'm grateful for you, sister. If I could just say one thing in closing, which is we've just come back from DC and uh, met with lots of influencers while we were there and connected with once a lot of our friends from the movement and across the world. And 
this is an important time for everyone to be taking a firm stand um, and to, to gain language about our live experiences and tell the world that people like us exist. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know that because they're, we're not getting opportunity as much anymore. We used to have a lot more like secular media opportunity, just not there. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. actually have to take the harder action and go do it. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that you're leading the charge in that. And you guys, we need to take our exhortation um, seriously. And I'm speaking to my own leaders who are listening <laughs> right now. Okay. We got to take this seriously, get our voice out there. Freedom March is doing one aspect. It's profound. We also need to play a part. So praise God. Thank you, sister. I appreciate Thanks. your time. Thank you so much, so we Anne. We will hear more of her testimony, yes. but not during this conference, I'm afraid to say. So <laughs> keep it in mind for another time. Thanks, Elizabeth, for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is way awesome, don't you think? <laughs> it's just, just, uh, just pretty cool to be able to have these precious friends that we built relationship with over many years, come and join us. And you don't realize that you are not only not alone, but you have a body of believers that are behind you folks. If you're walking out of homosexuality or you're a ministry leader, I just wanna let you know that there are dynamic and, and significant people who are standing alongside who, that you need to get to know, that you're not alone, you are not alone. Okay, now I'm gonna play um, a video from another friend of ours, Dr. Michael Brown. Um, I just have to go over and pull it up. Well, so, it's my delight to introduce to you. Um, Dr. Michael Brown, there's an intro here. I'm gonna cut right through the intro. Um, and hope of repentance and new life in Christ. For it's it's longer than this, but you will get a portion of it. Okay, so here I am going to share my screen. And yes, I recommend you do recommend uh, interviewer Stacy. So just an FYI. Okay, I need Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> help. <laughs> She's coming. I see the um, player. Do I need to put it in? Here's the thing I want to play. Here's this window. It's not showing. Okay, so what I'm going to do, you guys are just going to take one second longer. Uh, yeah, Jesus, we knew need to come. <laughs> and praise God for Steph. So what I'm going to do is um, put it into the slide. I'm going to embed it right now and then it should work. It's not a link. Um, what? Where's the video right here? Boom. Okay, you guys, this is gonna work. Yes, Lord, please let it work. Well, that's really tiny. Okay, this should work. All right, slideshow. All right, let's try it saved first, right? She's Stephanie. Come here, come here. This is the girl who's doing, she doesn't want to be on the screen, but she's done a lot of the solve it technical. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't warn you about that. Okay, and I didn't even conceive of it until just a second ago. So there we go. Hold on. We have to share it with sound sharing first. Window, share audio. Praise God. All right. Well, it's my delight to introduce to you at 16. I mean, you came into contact with the living God through Jesus and you surrendered to him. And that's a profound, profound experience. Okay. I'm whispering. You can hear me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. We're going to skip past his testimony. I mean, me introing him. Dr. B Michael Brown is, um, 
he is with Dr. Michael Brown Ministries. There will be a, a button down below. And so I began to meet with local gay activists. I would read stories of, of different gay leaders, those claiming to be gay Christian, etc. And the more I'd read, the more my heart would break for the people as I realized struggles, as I realized rejection they had passed through and how they felt that, that God hated them. Uh, or, or they tried to change and they couldn't. So that's what got me focused even more on the question of, of change. And, and I had known over the years ex-gays, never really thought much of it because Jesus changes people. You know, what was the big mystery here? To the core of our being, we need changing, and he changes us. So what, what happened was, is, as I began to see the complete rejection even of the idea of ex-gay, that when I realized that, hey, hang on, if, if your whole argument is we're born this way, it's innate and immutable, we're born this way, we can't change, and people are changing, then that undermines the whole gay activist argument. And I began to see that the, the people that were, were suffering really double rejection were those who said, hey, I, I'm ex-gay, I've, I've left that lifestyle, it's not who I am anymore. Because you went through the rejection first of coming out and saying I'm gay or I'm lesbian, I'm trans, whatever it is, and maybe your family rejected you, your church rejected you, then once you were at home in that community, you realize, no, that's not who I am. Jesus wants me to live a new life in him. And, and now you get rejected and hated. And I really felt, wow, I've, I've got to stand together with, with these who, who are, you're just trying to live your lives. You're just trying to honor the Lord. You're just trying to say change is possible. And you undermine a whole massive activist movement. So there's, there's a unique attack that comes against you. And then this idea that if you tempt it one time, if you struggle one time, then that denies the whole thing. You live with that kind of pressure on you. And I felt, no, I've, I've got to stand together with my brothers and sisters here and say, number one, in Jesus, all things are possible. And, and number two, you are not isolated and alone. You are under attack because you're like the tip of the spear un undermining the lie of innate and immutable and, and also a living test. A sinful lifestyle behind and identify as children of God, I, I realized that what that the churches prayed to, so oh, I, no. I felt to stand together, to show solidarity, to affirm, and, and, and to say together is it Jesus, back on? Let this witness is it back on, you guys? Wow, that is such an and encouragement, so a word of encouragement, because it is, it is really a tough thing to embrace the whole gay community indeed um to turn around and go wow i'm not sure if i fit here I, jesus's love is overwhelmingly more bright and beautiful than what i find in the gay community or relationships there and then to be rejected and pushed away and demeaned what i'm finding these days is that it seems to be entering the church now uh that the church is beginning to believe, and I don't mean every church, I don't mean every denomination, although nearly, <laughs> uh, that people can't really leave homosexuality, that there, there, there are uh, advocates now within the church saying people can't repent. It's ironic that the modern church movement seems to be headed towards this very same message, but Christianizing it, maybe, maybe making it a little more tender hearted or sounding nice. But interestingly enough, that's a, a person from the, uh, the Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, uh, Westboro Baptist Church. Um, they stood outside of focus on the family and declared that. What would you say to people who are currently in the church who are advocating that people really can't leave homosexuality, that it's actually coming in a compassionate mode into the church. And the reason why I ask you this is because you have also studied this deeply. Um, Dr. Brown has written, uh, can you be gay and Christian responding with truth and love, love and truth about homosexuality? What would you say to people who are advocating for this and churches who are opening their door to it? The, the first thing I would urge them is do not deny the power of the gospel. Do not downplay the depth of human sinfulness in every human being, 
the fact to the core of our being outside of Jesus we're rotten and in need of redemption. And he doesn't just change us by superficially uh, touching up the exteriors, but he changes us from the inside out. So the power of the gospel is the power of the gospel to save, to transform anyone. Some people, as long as they can remember, want it to hurt people. Some people, it's, it's innate in them to be selfish or hateful or whatever, or some type of sexual perversion that they're ashamed to even speak of. As long as they can remember, Jesus can change anyone from anything. And Paul's explicit about this. After explicitly speaking of, of men who have sex with men, along with adulterers and, and drunkards and others in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, such were some of you. So don't deny the power of the gospel. And then let's also recognize that the first and foremost calling is to holiness, not to heterosexuality. In, in other words, the first calling is to say no to sinful behavior and not to affirm sinful desires. So we are saying, yes, you can stop living like this. Homosexual sin is, is not the one sin that the blood of Jesus cannot forgive or the one sin that the power of the Holy Spirit cannot break? Of course not. So we want to encourage people to preach the whole gospel. And what I find in a lot of churches is that people want to show empathy. They, they want to, to give a, a listening ear. They want to listen to folks who say, look, I tried to change and I couldn't change and it was like driving me crazy. And they, it's it just like, you know, many white Americans want to be woke now to social justice issues and, and be sensitive to things, but, but they, they often go overboard with it and go too far. So you want to listen so you can have empathy, understanding, and then you want to give the hope of the gospel. What I see in the churches is just a larger symptom of our humanism, a larger symptom of our listening to people more than listening to God. We should listen to people to get empathy and then listen to God for the power to set them free. And around the world, where the church is really growing and thriving, it's not preaching a compromised message. Around the world, where, where, where churches or, or house churches can't even find enough room for the people getting saved and getting transformed, to get set free from homosexuality is no different than a thousand other things. They haven't put this in a special category. And they're seeing Jesus change people. And I found out over the years, working with different ministries, or missions around the world, I found out that there were quite a few ex-gays that I didn't even know they had been married, serving together for years and years and years, and that Jesus changed them. Jesus changed them. They were, they were in happy marriages and things like that. And what, what I want to encourage, though, every, everyone that's, that's watching this is don't put pressure on yourself to live up to a standard that the world puts on you. Don't, don't put pressure on yourself that if you think a wrong thought or experience a temptation, that the gospel's not real. All of us are experiencing change in an ongoing way. There's instant deliverance from certain things, and other things, little by little by little, we walk out. The best thing the church can do is not put this in a special category, put it like everything else, make real disciples, get to the root of whatever the issues are as best as we can, and help people to pursue holiness. If they do that, they'll be blessed. And if they do that, there'll be a constant challenge to the prevailing gay narrative. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are grateful. Have a wonderful day. So Dr. Brown um, recorded that before, and um, I'm so grateful for him. He's on our board of reference also. If you want to learn more about Dr. Brown, he is actually a pretty profound uh, man, but he, as a youth, was an LSD drummer. I mean, he was taking LSD, he was drumming in a band, he was a drummer in a band, and just a youth kind of his life seeping away, and he had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ as a Jewish man. And so, he um, he's experienced life transformation. He's experienced things uh, along the way that are very different from those who are uh, grappling with LGBTQ, but he's had a passion to support his brothers and sisters who are undergoing this current cultural fire. And so I'm grateful for Dr. Brown. I'm sure you are. And um, thank you so much for, um, I'm grateful for you, Dr. Brown for participating, involving yourself with this and um, ministering to people so much. 
So uh, Deborah, why don't you join me back up on stage as you've already heard Deborah's on the board of Restored Hope Network and and she also by the way has D Bar Ministries. D as in the letter D. B A R R is in her last name. How about this? <laughs> I can show you her book. Here's one of her books, Deborah Barr, so you can see the spelling there. Anyway, you can look her up online and um, there's a whole lot of information about her on our website as well. So Deborah, would you close us out today in prayer? Yes, yes I would I be would honored, be honored to. to. Father, Father, in the name, the name of, of Jesus, Jesus, we are so grateful, God, for all that we received today. So much inspiration, so much testimony, so much encouragement. Lord God, I pray for each and every speaker who has spoken today, each testifier, God, and I pray for each and every person who has attended this conference today. Lord, I pray as they move away from their computers for the rest of this day, that you would just continue to bring to their remembrance exactly what you want to speak to their hearts. And God, I just pray a blessing over each and every one of them. Keep them safe, Lord. Speak to their hearts. Speak your heart to their hearts. And we are so grateful. We are so blessed. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I unmuted. They were trying to unmute me and we flipped it around. So this is kind of fun. You never know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> Deborah, thank you so much for closing us out, and we look forward to joining tomorrow. You guys, I just want to give you a quick update about what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, tomorrow morning, we have uh, Dan Hitz will invite us back, and, and or I will invite us all back, welcome us back, and Dan will open us in prayer. He's on our board. We're going to hear the testimony of Fatima McRae. If you were here last year, you heard Ron McRae's testimony. Ron, um, his wife, Fatima, will be sharing, and that will be amazing. Um, looking forward to that. Alex McFarlane will be presenting his keynote. He's a Christian apologist. I look forward to that time as well. Um, we're going to actually hear a testimony from a counselor, Jim Katsudis, who's on our board, and he's also in, um, on the, on the uh, referral counselor list for Restore to Hope. And there are many more things. So more workshops tomorrow. Dr. Uh, Reverend Linda Seiler, PhD, will be sharing on transgender ten, uh, trends, praying beyond your temptations. Dan Hitz, beauty of God's design and identity found in Jesus. Alex McFarland tomorrow in workshops. So plenty more. We really look forward to visiting with you. And I just mentioned the morning. The afternoon has a bunch more stuff too. Uh, that will be a delight. So. I can't wait to see you all again soon. Blessings on your evening. Remember, you can go to that button right below and um, definitely go there. The password is written right there too. God is good, no spaces, and capital G both. Uh, feel free to watch the pre-recorded workshops uh, during this evening or whenever at your own convenience. They're really good. Um, and blessings to each one of you. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>